Hey, Kathleen, I'll run the presentation if that's okay. That sounds great. Thank you. All right, perfect. Hey, Jen. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, stepping in here for Sergio uh, on behalf of CISA. We'll give it a, another minute for others to get back from lunch and we'll get started soon. Jen, since I think we're first up, should I try and share my presentation now? Or do you want me to wait? Yeah, yeah, that'd, that'd be great. All right, I think I'm seeing the attendee count increase, so um, I, I see people trickling in from lunch. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have a, a jam-packed agenda um, to discuss on needs determination and allocation. Um, we Our first presentation back from lunch is with uh, Vistra and Gridwell, um, since we did uh, conclude the last session 15 minutes late. Um, Carrie and Kathleen um, will give you until 145 and feel free to uh, answer questions throughout and I'll, I'll keep tally and, <clears throat> and and be the line monitor for questions that, that come in and please raise your hand if you have questions so that we could facilitate uh, better participation. So with that, um, I'm not sure. Carrie, are you the first one up? Yep, I'm first up. All right, take it away. Awesome, thanks. So I am Carrie Bentley. I um, am CEO of Gridwell Consulting, and I presented on a, what I called a seasonal slice proposal a couple meetings ago. Um, and last meeting, it seemed clear that there was still some um, additional discussion and maybe some misunderstandings around the proposal. Um, so Kathleen from Vistra offered us up to present today. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick overview of the two slice framework and describe how it's changed um, since the initial presentation I did. Um, and then Kathleen from Vistra is going to take over and talk about specific proposals for the peak load requirement and the net peak load requirement. Um, and then she'll hand it back over to me for the deficiency determination. Um, Kathleen's part is quite extensive, so I'm going to try and go over the framework pretty quickly. Um, at the end, I'll pause for clarifying questions. So the now two slice framework overview. So if you remember the two slice proposal enhances the current requirement methodology. Um, it primarily ensures hourly reliability through the counting rules and then through an additional net load requirement. Um, it's been modified from the initial proposal based on written comments that we got um, feedback from both Energy Division and the California ISO and then some individual discussions we've just had with different um, parties. So the first change I've made is it now incorporates Vistra's um, requirements, both for peak load and net peak load. Um, the net peak load still has several options, which Kathleen is going to present on in detail later. Um, it also adds a buffer to the requirements. Um, this is to account for um, an interesting, I think, uh, issue that multiple parties brought up, and that's for suboptimal battery dispatch. Um, this is the idea that we're relying on batteries to exactly show up, um, and that means they need to be charged at the right time, and they need to be discharged at the right time. And so what happens if, even though on the RA space we fully accounted for the batteries showing up, what if in the energy market they don't show up? How do we account for that issue in RA? Um, and the way um, I'm proposing we account for that is to add an additional um, epsilon term or buffer to the requirement itself. And I'll walk through that using pictures. Um, it also moves from a seasonal um, framework to a monthly framework. I personally strongly believe that um, a seasonal requirement it would be better for the market and lead to lower costs. Um, but I've heard loud and clear people are still really concerned that moving from a monthly to a seasonal requirement will increase costs. So um, at least for now, I propose that we maintain the monthly framework. Um, and then I propose more specific counting rules. Um, this workshop is not on the counting rules, so I don't get into detail on them here, um, but have given um, a fair amount of thought on how to enhance them. So here's the, the overview of the proposal itself. So it's monthly showings um, and it maintains alignment with the local and flexible products. I think it's pretty interesting that we haven't talked much about how this system RA framework is supposed to overlap with the CAISO's local framework. 
Um, I'll note that about 75% of CAISO capacity is actually located in a local area. Um, if you include imports, that means about two thirds of our RA fleet is local. Um, so when we start talking about changing the NQC, well, that NQC is also used to meet a local requirement. So we're going to have to make some um, really tough decisions very quickly about how to translate any of these frameworks um, into the CAISO's local um, framework. Or we'll have to say, okay, we're gonna keep everything exactly the way it is for local, and then just do this big framework or new framework slice a day for system only. But again, as I noted earlier, since two thirds of all RA capacity is local, I think that would be pretty silly. So I think, um, you know, we're talking a lot about batteries. We have a whole workshop dedicated to it. Um, as the other parties do their framework overview, I'd highly encourage them to start thinking about um, and discussing how their frameworks will work with local. Um, so that's um, a big, a big uh, consideration within my proposal is that it maintains alignment with that local program. Um, there is a system aggregate peak load requirement and that's allocated based on coincident load ratio share. I'm um, just like today in some ways. And again, Kathleen's gonna get into the details of that. Um, I do propose to enhance the counting rules, but a lot of the specifics will depend on what the CAISO presents in January. They're doing an analysis of how well UCAP will use historical performance to predict future availability. Um, and I think that certainly will inform um, this proposal. In general though, I think something like ELCC or UCAP is needed for any operationally limited resource. So that's wind, solar, batteries, use limited thermal. Um, and then finally, a, a key um, point of this proposal is that there is a system peak net load requirement. Um, but you know, I'd like to generalize that a little bit and say mostly we're thinking we need um, a requirement for non-solar hours because it really is, it's not we need um, to consider every hour, it's the non-solar hours when load is high where really we're struggling in terms of reliability. Um, at the last uh, workshop, PG&E presented um, an overview of all the different frameworks and they said they had trouble um, creating a picture um, for uh, Gridwell's proposal. Um, they were gracious enough to send me their data and I was able to use the exact same data they had um, for Gridwell's slice a day proposal. Um, so here's the two slice proposal and you could see how it's, it's sliced into two parts. So basically you just have solar and non-solar. Um, so you have a peak load requirement um, for slice one, and then for slice two, you use a peak net load requirement. Now, I don't think this is actually the best way to picture any of the proposals. Um, I think it's a challenge because all the frameworks provide a provide for a 24 seven must offer obligation. Everyone just heard SCE hit on that over and over again. Yes, we're proposed, yes, they're proposing hourly requirements and hourly counting, but if you procure it in any hour, you have a 24 seven must offer obligation. So I think that a better way is actually to, to think about capacity in terms of um, this figure. Um, and I know it seems like a lot, but I'll, I'll walk through it. And I, I think it's pretty intuitive once you take a look. Um, I also think it's really important when we look at figures to use as close as possible to accurate data, because that really gives us um, a clear picture of where we're struggling in terms of reliability. Um, so even though this says illustrative September 2022, this is using um, exactly 2021 load shape and data and um, RA resources from the CAISO. Um, and then I've just converted it into an NQC on the left-hand side um, for 2022. So what you have here is um, the uh, Y-axis is megawatts and then the X-axis is hours except for the first one. And what the first one shows is the RA capacity needed to meet a peak load requirement. And you could see that under this kind of imaginary illustrative scenario, um, hourly load, and this is a, a typical hourly load shape, it's actually taken from um, the peak day in 2021, um, exactly hits our RA um, requirement. So this is the worst imaginable day possible, basically, um, which will never happen, but just theoretically, let's say the worst imaginable day happens. Because um, again, that's, um, that's where we start having concerns. So that's what we wanna look at. So what we see here is the must offer obligation if we procure to our peak requirement. 
So this is basically today, right? We have a peak load requirement and that's the RH on the left-hand side under the NQC. I don't know if you guys can see my um, cursor, but um, this is the NQC, this is the shown RA, and this is the hourly must offer associated with it. So I wanna be really clear, we don't have to have a requirement in hour one to have a must offer obligation in hour one. And that's true under any of the frameworks. Under any of the frameworks, if you procure to the peak, you have that resource for its full 24 seven must offer obligation. So what you see here again is 2022. And I think a, a few things um, should be striking. The first one is there are no reliability issues in our one through, I don't know, 15, right? No one is concerned that the KISO is gonna run out of capacity or energy in hour six. I just wanna say that, that that is true now, it will be true for the next, I don't know how many years, for a very long time. So when we say things or we hear things like, we're concerned about um, insufficient energy or insufficient capacity in every single hour, that's really not true. Um, as um, the KISO has stated, as many people have done analysis has stated, what we're really concerned about is right here. It's these net peak load hours, or you know, just putting it more simply, it's we're concerned when the sun goes down when it's still hot and when load is still really high, like 20,000 megawatts higher than hour five, um, and we don't have solar to depend on. Well, what do we do then? And what do we do then in the context of having to rely on batteries? So this is what we really care about. So again, um, this proposal really focuses on two things. One, this, this peak load slice, which I'm showing, and then the next um, uh, uh, requirement, which is the net peak load slice. Oh, sorry. And then here, this is just where you could add an epsilon, but I'll explain that more in the net peak load. So now here's net peak load. And this is again, using the same data. So if you have a net peak load requirement, you have to make sure you have enough non-solar resources to meet a non, your peak non-solar hour. And again, you have a 24 seven must offer obligation. So even though this is your, your peak hour, you still get all this capacity and energy under the must offer obligation. Now, one of the big concerns that I've heard from a lot of parties, and I share it myself, is what if we're a little off with the batteries? Um, what if, for whatever reason, there isn't enough, well, there's almost always enough to energy to charge, but what if they just don't charge? What if the KISO market does a bad job? Or what if they just don't show up because you know they dispatched early because prices were higher? Well, then I think if we see that, and we should start observing that pretty quickly, because we're about to have you know at least two to 3,000 megawatts on the grid. If we observe those inefficiencies, then I would propose that that's not an individual LSE problem. That's actually not even a battery counting problem. That's an uncertainty that should be accounted for in the requirement. So that's what this epsilon term says, is that if we see an efficient battery dispatch or we see batteries not having enough energy to charge, which we probably won't, but if we do, let's make sure to incorporate that directly into the requirement. So now I've also heard, okay, this is 21 data, but things are gonna get bad. We're gonna have a lot of solar. We're gonna have a lot of batteries. What happens? Well, again, I think it's really important to look at actual data. So what this is, is the 2030 peak load forecast. And again, it's not a perfect load shape. I actually think this will probably go down a little bit because of all the um, behind the meter solar, but it's about right. And this is um, using the IRP build out for 2030. And this is what we could expect to have um, built and on the system in 2030. And what we see is a huge amount of batteries. Um, I did aggregate durations here, but just know that some of this is four hour and some of this is um, longer duration battery. Um, I also didn't distinguish between technology type or efficiencies, but you get the gist. It's a bunch of batteries. Um, and we have a huge build out of solar. Right, so I think two things should be really clear. One, even on these days, we should for the most part have sufficient renewable energy to charge batteries. And we should have sufficient renewable energies for two dispatches of batteries. I would expect to see battery discharge here and here. Um, but also I think what should strike you is that our net load curve and those post solar hours are becoming increasingly important. And we're no longer serving that like we are today with predominantly traditional resources. And now batteries are the predominant resource that are filling in um, after the sun goes down. So I would imagine that epsilon term now is going to become incredibly important 
Likewise, battery counting rules will become incredibly important. This is where the, the midterm IRP and their incremental ELCC approach um, for batteries, I think becomes incredibly important and therefore is a key aspect of this proposal. So again, not included in this two slice proposal is the check that each LSE has sufficient energy to charge their shown batteries. Um, and I'll emphasize again, that's because the goal isn't to have energy to charge batteries, it's to have renewable energy to charge your batteries. And that's, this must be a constraint within the IRP and contracts. I mean, really has nothing to do with RA. Um, there will be sufficient energy to charge batteries. We wanna make sure there's sufficient renewable energy. Um, and then um, in addition to that, um, you know, we do have the epsilon term. So if for whatever reason we do see it's an issue, we can start increasing the requirement. Um, to ensure that there is sufficient charging, um, but I think it won't be a concern. So just a, a quick recap. Oh, Peter is asking how Epsilon is calculated and set. Um, so I think that would be a detail that we could get into in a, a different workshop. Um, my um, just kind of gut is that it would be based on historical um, a kind of battery mismanagement, I suppose, by the CAISO would be one way to put it. Um, but we'd have to dig into that. Certainly, I could come up with a proposal for that if people are interested. And hey, Carrie, so this is Kathleen. I did oh, yeah. float, float something in the requirement section, um, but I'd caveat that it, a lot of this is work in progress. Um, so we can at least throw a couple of these alternatives out, um, but not spend a ton of time on it, too. Oh, thanks, Kathleen. Um, so to recap, um, RA is complicated already, and we should seek to simplify. And you know, I've said that a lot, but I want to emphasize that um, it, it, it really is increasingly important as already costs are rising for more, more, more and more renewables come on the system. And as costs are rising for Californians um, because of our renewable transformation, we should try and make sure that we efficiently procure and allow retirements. Um, the idea that we should procure a battery because someone, an individual LSC is short, you know, in hours two through five, I, to me that that is adding costs without any reliability benefits. And so if I could just emphasize that anything we do in this space should have a reliability benefit, um, I think will be key to limiting ratepayer costs throughout this renewable transformation. Um, so it's not just that RA is complicated and we should think, seek to simplify for the sake of simplification. We should seek to simplify for the sake of ratepayers. Um, and one of the largest benefits of belonging to an ISO is that ratepayers truly benefit from load and supply diversity benefits. And if you somehow mess up in this calculation and the load and supply diversity benefits aren't accounted for, and that leads to over procurement, this will directly lead to increased ratepayer costs. Um, and that's, I know, a very theoretical statement. And I, I thought about putting together how aggregate load serving entity profiles could lead to this over procurement. And I might still do that, but I would really encourage everyone to think about what as a grid, we need to serve reliability and whether we actually need to have some sort of complicated accounting and transaction program for you know hours one through 14. To me, that just seems unnecessary. Okay, so then the two slice proposal, I think it does um, address kind of that um, simplification issue. It does address hourly reliability through enhanced counting rules. Um, again, it's not to say we can't do an hourly requirement. I just think if we do it, we need to be very thoughtful um, in the way we do it and to make sure it doesn't lead to over procurement. I think it's much easier to not over procure if you're enhancing the counting rules rather than the requirement. Um, so this framework really tries to um, identify all the issues with reliability and then meet those reliability goals in the simplest way possible and, and in a way that yields a very transactable product. Um, that said, still a lot to think through. And so Kathleen is going to go into um, how to calculate the different requirements. Um, are there any clarifying questions before I move on? Carrie, it looks like we have two. Uh, we have Brent first. Brent, did you want to ask some clarifying questions? I, so I, I did, and maybe we'll go back to, well, actually, uh, maybe I can just ask without 
referencing. So are MCC buckets retained in this proposal? It seems like they need to be. So MCC buckets um, are, are only, only need to be retained if you don't have a net load requirement and you don't have effective counting rules um, like ELCC and UCAP, then MCC buckets are really important. So under this proposal, I propose to maintain ELCC, MCC buckets, sorry, maintain MCC buckets for one year, um, check to make sure that they're not needed, they shouldn't be needed, um, and then to retire them. Okay, and, and so uh, it, th this chart's helpful. So you're showing that with the expected mix of resources, we cover all hours. Um, but I guess implicit in that is that everything procured, everything expected in the, in the current draft PSP um, uh, that was in, in the ruling, I assume that's where, where this came from, uh, is going to be an RA resource. So, so you're saying basically IRP will take care of it, contract every every resource in the state, and and you'll cover your needs. And if IRP sees there's a need in hour ending seven, um, you know IRP will, will handle it by ordering additional procurement. No, 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 not at all. I'm saying that you have resource counting rules, and you need to ensure that you meet the peak, and given um, your ELCC, which is continually updated, your UCAP is continually updated. If you can meet your peak and your a non-solar hour peak, then your must offer obligation will allow you to meet all 24 hours. I, I mean, that's a very I, hopeful, hopeful look at it, right? Can I so, um, jump in real quick? I just wanted to note that we're gonna delve into this um, and address Brent, I think what you're raising. The, and the, I heard you say hopeful. I just want to let you know there's a lot of detail when we get to the requirement piece on this. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for that. But yeah, okay, cool. without being explicit, I'm not sure how you how you get all 24 hours of reliability. So yeah, in our so, next section, we're going to provide a proposal. Yeah, an explicit proposal. But also, you know, I I'll note that your counting rules, your ELCC, are very explicit about ensuring reliability during peak. How do you count solar across all hours? How do you account for wind across all hours, given the other resources in your fleet? How UCAP will say, right? How reliable are you compared to, you know, this ideal world? And that's across all 24 hours. So you could do it on the requirement side, or you could do it on the counting to side and reduce how much RA is shown. For example, I'm not relying in this hour on solar for this amount, right? This is the amount of RA capacity over here on the NQC that gets to be shown. Likewise, when the sun starts going down and you don't have that solar, it's not available. Solar doesn't count anymore. So I'm not relying on solar to show up when it's not there. I'm saying you have to procure this amount of thermal capacity and batteries and hydro, which I know will be there because that's how I've counted, I've described my counting rules. I know that the way I have calculated my qualifying capacity for thermal is that I'm gonna get about 30,000 megawatts of thermal, you know, in hour ending, or what is this, hour ending 20. So it's not hope, it's math. Yeah, it just seems like a way to back into the 24 hours, the 24 slice proposal. Yeah, no, actually, I just, I completely agree with you there. You could either do it on the requirement side or you could do it on the counting rule side. And the problem with doing it on the requirement side is that you end up having individual LSCs having to procure to a load shape that could end up leaving, leading to over procurement. And you end up focusing on all these hours that don't matter for reliability. But I completely agree with you, Brent, that ultimately you're trying to get to the same solution, which is hourly reliability. Okay, should we go to the next question? Yeah, um, maybe go to Nick next. And, and it sounds like the full picture, the full proposal isn't presented yet. So let's uh, focus on clarifying questions to Gary's presentation. Go ahead, Nick. Thanks, Jen. Hey, Jen, I'm, I'm happy to wait until the end of uh, Kathleen's presentation and come back. Sounds good. Doug? Oh, 
Yeah, sure. likewise. Okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, case, Kathleen. Yeah. Okay, great. No, and I appreciate, um, thank you so much every, um, for bringing that back and forth and um, and for the opportunity for Vistra and Gridwell to present today. So I just want to throw that out there. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to provide some, my goal, my goal with this section of this presentation is really to provide, to contextualize what we're trying to do under this two slice in the world of a two slice proposal. Um, I think it, you know, I just want to throw a caveat out there that, you know, Vistra is still struggling in turn, you know, we're struggling with can a slice approach, is that an improvement to what we have today? But we're participating in these workshops in good faith, trying to think through, okay, if we did switch and transition to this type of framework, what's a workable way to do so? Um, and that's the kind that's the lens that um, I'm bringing this presentation forward. I'm really looking and I know Carrie is Carrie and I are looking for feedback on any reactions to what we put forward out here. And um, so I'm looking forward to um, the back and forth. Uh, before I get into the details on the requirement, I did want to throw one thing out there because of the back and forth on bundling um, or unbundling from the last and specify that we didn't say what was not included in this framework, but my understanding is that even under this frame, this two slice framework, that it would be bundling of a single RA product and that LSEs cannot trade the slices of RA. And so I just wanted to clarify that that's something that is important to Vistra, is a part of, of these proposals that um, LSEs would not be allowed to trade the individual slices. So I think that's helpful context before we go into the requirements. Okay, um, I wanted to start with any type of need determination and the r related rules that we come up with should address the following current RA challenges. And, and I'm, I'm want to add this context to say what are why are, expanding on what Carrie just provided. Why are we here? Um, the first challenge is RA construct does not accurately capture the value of use limited resources in either the reserve margin or county rules. Carrie talked. And, and pretty in some good detail about how those items need to be looked into. Um, I won't expand on that, but it's something that I think look forward to revisiting in future workshops. But I think it's important as a principle that tying resource capacity value to its ability to show up when needed and carry load through risk of loss of load is the goal. It improves reliability and it reduces the uncertainties that need to be included in, in any requirement. The second challenge is our RA construct is not maintaining a one in 10 planning standard today. Um, California is unfortunately operating at a lower reliability threshold than the majority of the US. This is largely a function of the fact that the um, our PRMs haven't been updated in such a long time. We need to be focused on setting a probabilistically determined requirement through a loss of load expectation study set to meet a one in 10 standard that is updated regularly as, as system conditions change so that this that our requirement can't we can be confident is supporting reliability. The third challenge is that there's inconsistencies across the CPUC and CAISO RA programs. Um, it is one of our goals and one of the things that I I, I heard earlier um, in the presentation is that we are you know one of the the goals is to seek consistency across the rules to reduce regulatory uncertainty, complexity, and administrative costs. All of this leading to more cost effective and reliable outcomes. And I so appreciate Carrie's context on like on a focus of not inadvertently um, increasing cost to ratepayers as an unintended adverse outcome. Our final goal, our challenge here is that RA contracts are bundled across system local and flex. If flex capacity is included in that resource, um, the data carry throughout there was so I think that is very meaningful um, to keep in mind that these contracts include all of these attributes and that any changes we make here um, need to be considered how they impact the entire resource as a whole. Next slide, please. So I, I need some more context. I think there's a great deal of good work that's been done on this topic. Um, one of the assessments that I have found helpful for contextualizing this issue is um, out of WEC. So WEC has um, performed assessments on RA and it performed an RA spotlight on the California and Mexico subregion. What WEC saw is that 
under our current system to account for the increased variability challenges that the system is seeing, a probabilistic approach to LOLE is needed. Um, what provided analysis showing that planning reserve margins need to account for the demand and resource availability variations to better meet one in 10 standards. Um, out of this study, what WEC found is that if you look at it on an annual basis, a 15% reserve margin is probably enough to maintain a median one in 10 threshold. However, my next slide, I'm going to show you that that's just median is just one of the potential outcomes. It, there are, depending on the variations of how you include in the probabilistic study, the what is needed to maintain a one in 10, if you make it more conservative or more relaxed, will change drastically. And you'll see that on the next slide. The other finding WEC had is that, however, if you look at it on a monthly basis, the months of May and June, we're looking at needing a reserve margin closer to 40% um, to maintain one in 10 during that month. Next slide. So here's my, this is a visual um, and I provided the source. So when these are posted on the CPUC's website, you'll be able to go to the link and, and read a, a lot more detail about this study. And it, it's a good one. Um, but this is one of the visuals I, I really liked. In addition to deep diving on the other um, variability, so demand variability, resource variability, WEC looked into planning reserve margin. Um, what's the percent needed for a reserve margin to maintain that one in 10 across all the hours in 2021. WEC, um, per, look, as I mentioned, that if you look at this from a probabilistic scenario, there are probabilistic approach that depending on the scenarios that you use, you can achieve different levels. So a more relaxed um, approach might look, might calculate a minimum PRM. A, median, as they mentioned, um, is shown in blue, and then orange, which is a more conservative ap approach, includes more uncertainties. If you include that the probability of those risks, then the amount of reserves that need to be maintained, and you'll see here the the spike of orange around May and June, um, reach up to near 40%, but it varies across the year. One, I, thanks, Carrie. No, no, that's good. Um, they're not the only one who's, you know, been looking into this. Um, and I'm going to throw in a, sh a shout out to our resident CPUC Energy Division. I I found the presentation and the information that you provided at the November 2021 workshop helpful to add context to this discussion as well. Um, the Energy Division's ana analysis showed similar results to what I what I understand from the WEC assessment, where annual needs maybe generally. Are, are tracking towards the one in 10 threshold, but specific months are meeting lower thresholds. We are less resource adequate in specific months than we are if we were to look at this on an annual basis. Some other things to note from the CPUC's that, um, presentation is that they uh, commented that the current planning reserve margin has become increasingly divorced from a loss of load expectation study framework, and I couldn't agree more. Um, also, the current PRM was calculated back in 2004 with a very different fleet and is really stale. And this is me adding my context. That PRM is stale. We need to revisit how we determine these requirements under this um, long term structural reform. The Energy Division staff performed a loss of load expectation modeling for the 2022 study year to compare an RE portfolio that meets um, a 0.1 threshold, so the 1 in 10 threshold, using the 2019 IPER. I would note that the results are informed and are going to have um, going to be a function of the net qualifying capacity values that we have and that are being used in this um, analysis. And as I think you've heard um, myself, you've heard others mention that there's a lack of confidence that the net qualifying capacities are accurately capturing the liability value. So while I don't have numbers and data to support this intuition, my intuition is that if we were to update the approach for the counting rules and recalculate this type of analysis, it would show it would likely show um, worse results. So results that um, are missing the reliability threshold by a greater degree. The other thing that the Energy Division noted is that um, they looked into two of the peak months, August and September, to see how we would, if we move forward with a UCAP versus an ICAP, what that reserve margin out of the loss of load expectation study would be needed. Um, throughout some of the quotes from that presentation, 
And I think you go to the next slide, there's a, a visual of that. Oh, no, I didn't snip that. But um, what I would add the context of is that the loss of load expectation study that they provided produced an amount of generation that is needed to meet a one in 10 based as a function of the RA County rules compare and then compared that to the CEC's forecast for that month to come up with a reserve margin. That's incredible. I think that is important because what they're and part of that study includes a probabilistic approach. So some of these uncertainties that we experience actually inform that final out that output from the LOLD on the amount of generation capacity needed to meet a one in 10. Next slide. So that brings me to um, our proposal. Our proposal for establishing the first slice, the gross peak slices requirement, is to use a probabilistic loss of load expectation to set monthly gross peak requirement. Um, the probabilistically determined loss of load expectation will capture hourly needs. It, second, it will use, we propose it should use the hourly forecast update, um, Kaiso's mid mid case in the most recent, in any, in any iteration of this study, it would use the most recently available um, CEC's IPER uh, forecast, whether that's the full or the, the um, incremental, the updated IPER, as the basis for the projected load within the LOLE study. For the target year model generation capacity online, so what is generation capacity that's being modeled within this study? Um, we're proposing that it include all baseline resources, so all um, online resources today, plus I think that there is an adjustment that needs to be made um, to include any projects with executed contracts for that year, so that are that is expected to achieve COD. I think the need for this is being driven by you know IRP procurements as well as the CPE forward procurements that are leading to forward executed contracts for RA for a future year that we have fairly we have high assurance will achieve COD at least to ensure the LSE's compliance with those requirements. Um, and we can talk about I'm happy to answer and kind of explore that. I think this is an expansion to what the LO, what the CPUC energy division, I believe, um, performed when it was doing its study. Next, I'm, we propose that this study should be performing a loss of load hourly calculation. We should be calculating the loss of load hours, which is the sum of all hourly loss of load probabilities in a year uses 8,760 hourly probabilities. Um, those probabilities range between zero to one, depending on the probability the specific outcome might occur. And that this probabilistic loss of load expectation study should use, yes, I'm sorry, Nick. Um, I don't know, Carrie, if you wanna jump in real quick, or if you guys wanna suffer through my, my woodwork. Um, it's fine, keep going. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, nah, it's me. Uh, but my, so our proposal, it's okay, Nick. Thanks, sir. I apologize uh, for the background noise. Um, our proposal is that these uncertainties should be captured in the probabilistic loss of load expectation study. So I know, Peter, you asked, uh, what are some options for determining the epsilon um, that would cap capture the operational uncertainty associated with suboptimal battery dispatch? Um, the approach or one of the alternatives that I'm, we're putting forward in this slide is that if you took a probabilistic approach to determining the planning, to determining the requirements, then you would include this new operational uncertainty. This operational uncertainty can be tuned to, and really for the gross peak requirement, what's the uncertainty? The uncertainty is a risk of a low energy scenario occurring. That can be modeled directly into the loss of load expectation studies. And by including that scenario in the potential variations, the, L the probabilistically determined LOLE will capture the risks associated with that outcome happening in determining the amount of total generation needed. Some other uncertainties that we believe need the variations to be captured, so the variations of risk include demand variations, forced outage risks, substitution risk for planned outages. 
And what do I what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that in a really low in a very tight capacity world, re, RE resources need to be able to take plan maintenance outages. But under the current rules, um, those can be declined if there is not substitution. However, substitution is really difficult to find and may not be available. It would be a more robust and appropriate approach in our view to include this risk in the probabilistic loss of load expectation study, similarly to forced outage risk. If over time, and, and part of the reason the probabilistic approach is superior to a deterministic is that these values will change and the probabilities of this being an issue can be updated with every iteration of the study. And so if the fleet becomes more, um, if the fleet expands and this risk is de minimis, then it wouldn't have an impact on the amount of generation needed for to meet a one in 10. And finally, I think we're all very familiar with the ver availability risks. And that should also be the ver availability variations should be uncertainties modeled in the loss of load expectation study. The study should be tuned to meeting a one in 10 reliability threshold. Next slide. OK, so the previous slide really focuses on how do you perform the loss of load expectation study in a way that we are capturing the variations of risks that the system sees to produce out of this probabilistic study what the total generation capacity is needed, incorporating these risks to meet a one in 10. This slide now takes that information. We have the output of the loss of load expectation study. What is our monthly gross peak requirement then? There are two options. Option A is we can set the monthly requirement using a loss of load expectations capacity requirement output that amount that was determined um, to meet a one in 10. I need to stress that um, any method needs to be updated depending on whether resource capacity evaluation will include those uncertainties I talked, I discussed. Um, so if it's included on the resource side, then th the need to include them in determining the probabilistic LOLE result would change. And so we will need to revisit this as we land on some of the counting rules. But we take that total generation capacity that the LLE um, provides for each month and then set the slice requirement for the first slice, the gross peak for each month as the monthly total capacity needed to meet a one in 10 that was identified in the LLE modeling and then allocate to each LLC, same as today. Compare that to an option B to set the monthly requirement using the reserve margin on top of the CEC's monthly forecast. So you could calculate a planning reserve margin for each month. And how would you, how could we go about doing that? Use the loss load expectation modeling output. Again, start with the total generation capacity needed informed by those probabilities to maintain a one in 10. Also use the managed one in two monthly peak load Kaiser coincident system peak value for each month provided by the CEC, the most recent value. Apply the percent difference to the monthly Kaiser coincident peak to set the monthly need. And I provide a couple formulas there to just um, anchor a little bit more. Take the LLD capacity needed that was produced from the, that study, divided by the managed one and two monthly Kaisa coincident peak to determine the reserve margin, and then take the monthly Kaisa coincident forecast times that PRM. Allocate to each LLC same as today. I want to emphasize that option A or option B arrive at the same requirement. There are just different ways of looking at it. If there is a strong preference to first set the PRM, then there's a this is a method, option B is a method of doing so. Alternatively, we can rely on the LLE generation capacity requirement and then perform the equivalent of a PRM to use it more as a reliability metric, which would be more similar to, I think, how um, Wex analysis was, was showing it. While I didn't add additional options, I would say that there are other options. Determining, setting the requirement based on a deterministic Planning reserve margin is one is an option. It's one that we think is inferior because it doesn't really capture the risks that the system is seeing, where a probabilistic one does. However, if you were, if this there's a strong preference to not do a probabilistic approach, then um, the description that Carrie provided for how to use historical information to set the epsilon would be one of the uncertainties determined 
and used in a deterministic PRM similar to the other uncertainties I noted, demand, forced outage, substitution risk, and variability, and then plus the epsilon, which is equivalent to that operational uncertainty value. Next slide. Here's some implementation considerations, and, and it also kind of talks through why we think this is a good idea. Um, the energy division discussed California's approach to this loss of load expectation back in November of 2021. Um, and I think that might actually be 2020. That might be typo. Sorry, guys. You get lost in my years. Um, and provided some considerations for potentially using the LOLE studies to determine system RA needs. LOLE modeling being done with the CPC energy division generally accomplishes the goals of our proposal with the need potentially for incremental modeling improvements, but this is incremental improvements rather than a wholesale redesign. And it, the, in addition to the incremental modeling improvements, really what is being proposed is to use it for setting the requirement based on some of those options rather than only for setting the LCC. Why do we think this, that we are largely there? Um, the CPUC is modeling 8,760 hours, which is part of our proposal capturing hourly probabilities and expected output scenarios. Um, what may need to be revisited is whether these dispatch scenarios uh, need to be reviewed, especially for storage or use limited resources to better tune them to how they're being used in operations today, as well as to ensure that the other uncertainties I discussed are being included in the variations um, informing this probabilistic study. Next, they are using a probabilistic approach. Um, and as that, that is a big part of what makes the proposal uh, that we're putting forward um, an improvement over the current condition. What may need to be looked at in detail is the range of conditions and uncertainties that need to be included. It's also using the CEC forecast. Um, we may need to look into which forecast in more detail, um, but at this time, I think largely uh, the principle in this proposal is to use the that CEC forecast in those um, to compare to the hourly probabilities. Finally, it sets the reliability threshold to one in 10. As I mentioned, county rules need to be updated to boost market confidence that the study is actually testing to one in 10. Another part of this proposal um, and building off of what Mr. presented back in October is that we really need greater involvement from CAISO to ensure there is a shared view of the system reliability need. We believe CAISO and CPUC should coordinate more closely in this loss of load expectation modeling. At a minimum, um, we think CAISO needs to have more agency in informing the uncertainties, um, those uncertainties I discussed before, as these are observed in the operational timeframe. This is the timeframe that CAISO has both the best information and the most experience with. And we think that it is critical that the very that the different scenarios captured in the LLLE modeling are capturing the scenarios of risk the CAISO is concerned with. These studies need to be updated regularly to be sound. Um, ideally, annually. And in my mind, I see it as a part of the annual RA proceeding. But if this isn't feasible, then no more than every two years or else they will become too stale and won't represent system conditions. The ELCC for each um, bucket needs to be updated after each LOLE study, as this is an input back into the next iteration of the LOLE study. Next slide. Um, this is an update to a slide that Mr. put forward back in October, um, kind of providing, talking through some of the benefits of regularly updating the requirements and having a shared responsibility between the CAISO and the CPUC. Um, I've updated the chart to really emphasize that the first step is to update the inputs to the study. The second is for the CAISO and the CPUC to collaborate on those scenarios to ensure that we're capturing uncertainty factors that need to inform our requirement. This should provide CAISO greater engagement to inform or provide uncertainty scenarios to increase CAISO's confidence in the results. And the reason I note that is I think that having, in, having the CAISO have confidence in the requirement will help um, limit some of the, the concerns that um, procurement may fall back to a backstop mechanism. Um, from there, uh, there's a few other benefits, but I believe I talked through them at my last presentation, so I will, I will for, uh, for time, um, close those out. Before we move to slice two, 
um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kathleen. Hey, Kathleen. Oh, Jen, do you want us just, I know we're running out of time. Would you like us just to finish up or should we pause? Yeah, let's just finish up and try to see, be sure we reserve some time. OK, great. I will keep going then. Um, so let's talk slice two, uh, the peak net load requirement. This is um, we want to provide some options here. Uh, what are what we're proposing is that there be a peak net load requirement added to the RA construct to capture the non solar hour reliability need. Currently, the KISO has the most trouble with reliability during peak net load hours due to the shift from relying on solar to relying on other resource types. While ELCC and exceedance measure solar availability, any amount cannot capture that solar simply isn't available at night, that non-solar hour. Thus, there needs to be an explicit check that during peak demand after sunset can be served by non-solar resources. There are multiple ways to do this. Um, And actually, before I lay out some of the options, I will say there's all there's even multiple ways to to kind of look at it as are you looking at non solar or even looking at hours with limited solar? And I can share some more on that in a later slide, but keep that in mind. I think that sometimes binary scares folks. And so I think there are ways to do this where it's it's not binary. It's more of a, a spectrum. But I, um, back to the options, there are multiple ways to do this type of check. One, you have an hourly requirement overnight. This is probably the most complex, definitely the most administratively burdensome, but also complex. Um, peak net load requirement using um, something similar to the KISO's local methodology. A peak net load requirement using something similar to KISO's flexible RA method, or an, an even potentially requirement based on peak net solar hour demand. Next slide. And I'll add this last one is just what the KISO proposed. Like you pick an hour, 8 p.m., and you meet demand at 8 p.m. in every month. That's probably the least complicated way you could do it. Cool. Thanks, Carrie. Um, adding some more context uh, to this discussion, uh, in that CPUC Energy Division study I mentioned, um, the CPUC highlighted that there is this increased net peak need. I found the heat map that they provided really useful um, to be a, a visualization of this. They noted that the reliability risk continues to move to the evening, particularly in July and August, with a smaller risk in September. These heat maps are showing the amounts of expected unserved energy identified under that loss of load expectation modeling for the target year 2022 for each hour and month. It shows when a loss of load risks are expected to occur, which you can see um, on the y-axis is the hour, the x-axis is the month, and then the values are within the heat map themselves. And the values are showing an expectation of the magnitude of such an event. The CPUC Energy Division also noted that they saw the loss of load period, um, loss of load probability periods are likely during um, the hour beginning 18 through hour beginning 20. So these dark, uh, darker blue um, periods on on this heat map. And I think to what you know carries uh, what I just heard you say about eight o'clock. That is that that would be one. Some of this analysis is some support saying pick the hour, the worst need and test that uh, from an expected unserved energy. That's an approach that could be considered as well. Um, next one. I wanted to crowdsource a couple of the things the KISO is doing. Um, I think it is important to level set that the KISO has this reliability um, imperative. And so these issues and concerns that have been arising over time, the KISO is a, has been working on addressing them and including how do we kind of come up with a net load or idea of what's our net load need. Um, it's possible that we could start with some of these approaches um, and that there could be some benefits of consistency. Uh, one process in which the KISO does this is under flexible RA. Um, this already includes determining net load requirements and some solar and wind profiles. Under this process, the KISO relies on NERC's accepted metric of net load, um, where net load is the aggregate of customer demand reduced by variable generation power output. Uh, the KISO is using the CEC 1 and 2 IPER forecast managed net load. Um, on, and this is the, the hourly values, I believe. But I encourage the KISO to um, correct me or clarify. Um, this process also includes an approach for generating load profiles, solar profiles, and wind profiles. I want to be clear, the FlexRA gets to a ramping need 
Um, and that's not what we're putting out there, but it starts with identifying the net load periods, which could be a basis for starting to determine what the net load period and requirements are under this net load requirement. Another option is that under Kaiso's local RA, they're already incorporating a sufficient net peak approach. So in this process, Kaiso uses the CEC managed peak demand in the 2020-2030 baseline forecast. Um, these are annual forecasts, um, but they incorporate a peak shift so that the actual peak hour is later in the day. The, this shifts the need that the Kaiso is assessing. So we kind of think of it as an adjusted um, peak demand. And then the other thing that Kaiso does is it compares to see if we are resource sufficient by adjusting its valuation of variable energy resources and qualifying facilities. The Kaiso caps the capacity value of VERS in its locals uh, study so that it cannot exceed the historical or projected output values at the time of this managed shifted peak load. Um, it is capped at the lower of the net qualifying capacity, uh, which includes the technology factors, the ELCCs, or the output that is historically seen. This is a more conservative approach, ensuring that the value, the, the contribution of solar and is not, or wind or QFs are not overly being reflected in the studies so that the studies can better support reliability. Um, how do they go about looking at these different resources? Um, this Kaiso says they use the CEC provided solar output shapes for managed peak hour. Um, if the CEC doesn't provide it, the ISO creates the shape. For wind and qualifying facilities, these are limited based on assumptions, similar assumptions to that used in the Kaiso's TPP process. I'll note that I um, one of the things I've, I've followed up on the most recent local process, the Kaiso is asking for more information on these values. I think it could be informative here, and I'm hoping that uh, the Kaiso hasn't responded yet. Um, but if it does provide that information, can bring it back to the group. Uh, next slide. An another really important piece of context that I want to remind um, this community of is that the Kaiso has recognized this need to ensure sufficient capacity during a slice, this slice two that we're proposing, a net peak slice. The Kaiso expressed their interest in these workshops considering a framework similar to the one that we're proposing. Um, they stated in their opening comments on the proposed decision that led to these workshops that rather than starting with six time slices, the Kaiso was encouraging parties to move from a single monthly peak load requirement to include a monthly net demand peak requirement as an important first step. In, the, in this proposal, we've taken this idea and expanded it to find identifying that the best way to go about implementing this is to identify the two slices of day that are most important to support reliability. And I, we think that this is in line with both the slice of day proposal design concept, as well as um, the, the reliability concern raised by the Kaiso. Another piece of information the Kaiso has put out there into some of these proceedings is under IRP. The Kaiso has expressed concern that planning processes should better incorporate net demand, um, and noted that a one and two average demand forecast may be appropriate if paired with an allowance for a higher than average load during the peak and net demand peak. And next slide. So our proposal here is for this for the CPUC compliance purposes only is that the CPUC would perform a slice two net peak slice sufficiency test. We'd set a net load requirement. We, I went through some options. We need to talk about those in more detail and perhaps get some more um, Kaiso and CPUC input on that. Um, and then once that has been determined, it would apply a consistent approach to valuing the contribution of solar wind and QFs during a net peak managed hour to that which is being performed under local RA. We'll, we need the Kaiso to provide greater detail um, and also to coordinate with the CPUC to identify whether a new improved approach might be adopted or if retaining how the Kaiso is performing this today is the best approach. Um, and the reason I say this, we say this is that consistency across the programs is important. And if local RA is evaluating sufficiency in one manner, um, then we need to be mindful of perhaps that is the right manner to also be doing it for system sufficiency during these periods. Uh, next slide. Okay, perfect. Yep, this is the last slide. We have our deficiency determination just for completion, but as this is a requirement, not a deficiency check workshop, we're not going to go into it.
And Jin, uh, would you like us to take questions now or hold off until the question period at the end? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I just want to be sure you're able to go through all the slides. Um, so we might have to, we could take maybe um, a handful of questions now because we're at 145, the one hour time slot. But um, I also don't want to necessarily hold off to the very end because, you know, while this is fresh of mine, um, that'd be helpful to at least field questions for five to ten minutes. And so I'll, I'll try to um, be sure we don't run too much over so that uh, pg and &E and NRDC still have time. So did you want to quickly run through this last slide and then maybe feel? Oh, no, we don't have to do the deficiency. Let's just hop straight to questions. OK, let's do that. So I see in the queue, uh, Doug. Um, the reference to, to age me for sure. Um, yeah, so I'm not trying to wrap my head around how all this would work. Um, and, and I just want to spin out a hypothetical for you. Uh, it's not that hypothetical, actually. Um, so let's say we had an LSE that is relying entirely on wind, solar, storage, a little bit of geothermal thrown into the mix. My understanding here is that you know we would get some limited. So first of all, I guess my understanding would be that we get some limited value from the solar for peak, the peak requirement. But net peak would really be a matter of like having all of our storage would really be meeting the bulk of that, maybe some wind and, and the geothermal sitting you know at the bottom of that slice. And if that is all discounted by the ELCC, we would need to have roughly, you know, middle of middle of the decade, something like double, not not quite double the amount of storage um, to make the showing that we would actually like physically need to meet the net peak because you'd want to use ELCC here to discount rather than the actual performance. So I guess to that, my question is, does that sound right? Like that's what we'd be facing is big over on that? Um, I, I think you're asking whether um, the ELCC would measure a resources contribution to reliability in the net peak. And my answer would be yes. I, I think the ELCC would be an appropriate measure of resources contribution to reliability during the net peak. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I have Doug, a... can I add one more thing before you, if yeah. you don't mind? Um, Carrie, can you go back to one of the earlier, maybe go back a couple slides? Um, uh, one more to the proposal. Um, for net peak, I think that I think one thing that I, I kind of tease this with. Binary can be kind of scary. So let's talk a little. And so I, I heard you maybe catch that is that it's possible that during the net peak is could be binary and um, the solar wouldn't be there, solar or wind, et cetera. Um, I think that when we think about the net peak requirement, and the other thing is that I don't know without us doing more data, and we need to do this analysis to really refine the net peak part of the proposal. Okay. So granted. But with that, but it is possible. Let's use wind. Even with, even for wind, um, I don't think it's a binary that the wind isn't there, right? What what this proposal would do is something similar to what the Kaiser is doing, and look at historical output, which is, and in my mind, you could say exceedance is the right way to do that. And I think we just need to get the Kaiser on board with that's a good way to look at historical output so that we have consistency. So open to those kinds of conversations. But the ELCC sets the net qualifying capacity. And so our proposal is that it would use the minimum of the two. I want to acknowledge that if the if the historical output in is above somehow, which we still need to see data to support if this is even a concern, is above that NQC, it would be limited to the NQC, but that's the right, in our opinion, result to support reliability. If it's lower, then it would limit the amount of the contribution. And so it's really trying to check that we are not over counting for, sol for solar wind during whatever period is the one being assessed for the managed shifted peak load. Um, largely wind, I think, is what would have the largest contribution during those periods. Um, and that's still an important reliability concept of that we shouldn't be over counting or else we're not reliable. But the other thing that's super important is that the requirement is lower during that period. So while there are less resources that may count, 
your overall net peak requirement will be lower than your gross. And so that's something else that we need to look at to really understand the impacts of what some of your questions, which I think are all great, but I just wanted to. Oh, okay. Um, no, yeah, and I, we apologize. We didn't get into our enhanced counting rules, what Kathleen just described, but that is a, a key aspect of this, is to make sure you're accurately measuring a resource's contribution to reliability during that net peak. And that's key to prevent over procurement. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know whether it's appropriate to talk about the ELC use of ELCC in a particular hour at this point, because ELCC is a global measure across all hours. And so, um, you know, obviously more hours, there's particular hours that have a bigger leverage on the loss of load expectation than others. That's clearly true, but it it really is not a thing that is indicative of the contribution in each in, in any particular hour, it's across all hours. And so there's a pretty significant conceptual mismatch there. Um, wait, wait, just to, the, just to pause though, Doug, I just wanna make sure you understand the proposal. So if we go to what Kathleen was talking about, about using a heat map to determine when those um, loss of load hours may occur, right? That's the whole concept between using a probabilistic measure to determine both the requirement and the counting. So you don't have that mismatch. And Kathleen can describe it better. And I understand it's complicated, but it's a much more specific and accurate way to measure reliability than relying on historical averages on exceedance. So when you say there's a mismatch, I, I fundamentally disagree with that statement. This whole proposal yeah. is to ensure that there isn't a mismatch between hours of greatest need and capacity contribution to need. Yeah, that's, that's a longer conversation. I want to chew up all our time, like why why it's a mismatch. Um, but the second question I had really is, OK, so going back to my hypothetical or not so hypothetical um, LSC. So then we have a stack of batteries that we are using the net peak. Um, you know, let's say we can meet our peak. We can meet our net peak because of our storage. How does this proposal guarantee that we don't end up running into a reliability problem at three in the morning when our batteries have all run out because you know we do have to keep the lights on in all other hours and i think the you know under a you know 100 percent renewable portfolio there's there's like you have to also be looking at at particularly the early morning you know those i think between two two and six and a.m is going to be really potentially tricky and so how does how is that account um okay great question thank you uh so I can get into, um, so I wanna, and this is the perfect slide for it. So I think that really focusing on the probabilistic approach and the way that the loss of load expectation studies work, I, I think you're getting the vibe that we still think this is probably the right way to feed into this one too, um, even though there are, are other options, um, is that you have, it's important to recall that in those L loss of load expectation studies, that there are dispatch assumptions that are being made. One of the things I noted, I think, in the last section was we may need to revisit those dispatch assumptions um, now that we have more experience with these resources, including storage. And I think that's written on there, and I may not have explicitly called it out, but I do think that that is one of the incremental improvements to a loss of load expectation approach um, that we should be looking at those dispatch assumptions. Once those improvements are made to make everyone to increase confidence that the kind of scenario you just raised isn't happening because the dispatch across all 8760 hours is being rationally modeled in the loss of load expectation study, then that scenario isn't happening because the modeling is capturing that that if that were to happen, what the model would do is capture that as a loss of load probability period, honestly. So that becomes an LOLE hour. If the modeling were to result in an issue where we didn't have sufficient, we had expected unserved energy um, for one of these hours that we haven't thought is an issue, it's going to get picked up. And that's one of the reasons that I, you know, we think the loss of load expectation, probabilistically, a probabilistic approach is the right way to go about doing this because the kind of things that you raised, Doug, are going to get caught in that study. And so, Resources, if they're not there in that period, are going to have that impact their ELCC values. So a very clear way to understand that is simply to look at the midterm reliability and note how rapidly the ELCC of storage resources were discounted. 
And that's exactly getting at what Kathleen was just saying. But I think we should probably move on because Jen only gave us 10 minutes. <laughs> but we can pick it up later, Doug. Thanks. Yeah, let's, uh, since we do have time at the end, and I, I, at the same time, I don't want to run into other people's presentation times, let's go with Nick, Jeff, and Bridget and close the queue um, and have everyone else uh, join in at the end to follow up. So, Nick. Thanks, Jen, and thanks, Carrie and Kathleen, for bringing this forward. Kathleen, sorry to give you a hard time about the <laughs> wood saw. I didn't think that was you. You can That's okay. have a hard time about my dogs and uh, when they inevitably disrupt my presentation. Um, I have a couple couple comments and a question. Um, so first, Kathleen, on the discussion of calibration and LOLE, PRM, what you're calling Epsilon, but I think PRM calibration, I wholeheartedly agree with the intent there, and I'll be discussing some very similar concepts in the, in the NRDC presentation. I think with any of these frameworks, really there's a critical calibration step. And as you mentioned, we have a good sense of what resources are going to be coming in the imminent future, let's say subsequent or you know one or two compliance years. That, and that, that information is going to be really critical to getting the right PRM or Epsilon or whatever we want to call it to get the, the desired quantity of procurement. Um, the second comment is, is kind of related. And, and Carrie, this is more about the structure here. As I think you're you're correctly identifying that RA is all about <laughs> identifying reliability constraints and then developing a framework that gets LSEs to show the desired set of resources, that desired portfolio that gets you, when you run it through an LLE analysis, the desired reliability or whatever reliability analysis you want to do. And so I think you know there's a lot of common ground or should be across each of these proposals that however we set up the counting, there's a calibration step that's going to be necessary to get you to not be over procuring, under procuring. You really want to be as close to, to just right, whatever we think just right is, um, as possible. Uh, so I, I think I don't want to suggest it's not a, a potentially workable framework. Uh, I think any of these could be workable in that in that construct. Uh, what I'd like to understand is kind of procedurally. Yes, one of the goals is system reliability. That is the goal. But the commission has a lot of other goals, and we have in the existing framework a lot of infrastructure to prevent leaning between LCC, uh, LSEs. We have the LCC, or excuse me, the MCC bucket constructs, which already requires LSEs to functionally shape their RA portfolios to look like system load. And you know, over the last year and a half, we've been discussing and debating all these different frameworks. Um, and, and ultimately what the commission adopted in July directionally was a continuation of these frameworks that require LSEs to shape their load, not, not to get rid of MCC buckets and go to nothing, but to expand that construct and make it more intuitive and sort of useful for LSEs to actually have some control over how their resources meet their load shape. So I, I guess what I'm struggling with is procedurally, you know, this to me feels very distinct from what was adopted directionally in July um, having lived through that, you know, first half of debating the frameworks, and I'm I'm curious your thoughts on how we kind of bridge this with the decision that was to, to develop and implement PG&E slice of day framework, and how it meets the other goals the commission set out around energy sufficiency, um, LSE leaning, et cetera, that are set out in the decision. You know, one one example that comes to mind is if we were to adopt this and get rid of the MCC framework. You could think of a hypothetical portfolio for a small LSE where they're showing just a tremendous amount of solar for the peak slice and showing just a lot of demand response for the net peak. Now that's an edge case, but I think that's kind of the exact construct the MCC buckets are intended to prevent. And the slice of day framework again would sort of force LSEs to be more consistent with their own actual needs. So curious if you can talk through kind of procedurally. And consistency and just from uh, the standpoint of like we're two and a half months away from a decision for implementation of uh, something that was directionally adopted several months ago that looks very different from from this kind of novel proposal. Hey Nick, I'll start um, and then let Carrie fill in on more of the, um, the structure because I, I want to focus on the need determination piece first, if that's okay. Um, we do see this is very consistent with the, the the final decision that um provided the direction for these workshops um as well as the principles that are in that um and i don't have them memorized but i'll tell you the ones that are important to me are that they balance costs 
um, that we be mindful about the complexity and transactability of the program and that we account for hourly needs. I will say that um, our focus on the requirement side is both probably two pronged um, and I can we can take a deeper look and make sure that we're touching on all the other stuff in there, but the two prong focus of accounting for hourly needs. And second, um, and I don't recall if it was minimizing or balancing costs um, was the, the wording used in the decision, but let's say balancing costs to consumers of these proposals. This proposal for setting the requirement um, is a level of detail that I don't believe was in that decision. And so we've taken the direction to determine and to follow up on, okay, we've defined slices, two slices, a gross peak slice and a net peak slice. How do you set the requirement in the gross peak slice and the net peak slice to account for the hourly needs in that, um, in those periods? And our proposal is that for the gross peak slice, we account for all hours in the loss of through the loss of load expectation study. So check, we've accounted for the hourly sufficiency um, need requirement that the decision put forth. The other thing that we're really mindful of though is that a and I guess I, I'm not sure I specifically called this out, is that uh, we put out the, the the basis if you were to use a forecast that we'd allocate the same as today. So a part of that which was implicit, but I'll make it explicit, is that you do a top-down approach. And that top-down approach captures diversity of both demand and supply across the entire um, system. And through that, we can ensure that we're balancing costs. I don't recall specifically a requirement for LSEs to have custom shapes um, out of that decision, but I also want to note a detail that may get lost, is that while generally this is a top-down proposal for the gross peak slice and net peak slice, it's not actually that simple. So the CECs manage one and two monthly forecast. My understanding, and I think Lynn clarified this in one of the earlier last workshop, um, but what I have understood is that it's a bit of a hybrid. It's a top-down but LLCs are able to work with the CEC to um, kind of make some adjustments. And so she, and I appreciate Lynn's uh, presentation earlier, and if you're still on the on the um, meeting and want to clarify, that would be helpful. And I um, invite you to do so um, now if you'd like. Well, I, I think yeah. the IPER adopted forecast is the CEC's own forecast, and we do discuss that with utilities and take comments. But I think what you're referring to is the RA forecast process mm -hmm. where um, we get a LSEs submit their forecast and then we adjust it. A oh, little bit different flavor there. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll look forward to refining our proposal and I, I hope to reach out to you, Lynn, so we can um, delve into some more of the details on the forecast we're proposing. In our mind, we think starting with what we have today from a forecast perspective um, is the best approach and that incorporating hourly needs through a loss of load expectation is the way to account for the hourly needs, um, which I think is a different interpretation of the, the direction, but that's how we've interpreted it. Yeah, and I'll just uh, finalize, I guess, or add on just one tiny thing and that's if in our analysis we saw in the next decade the need for four slices our proposal would have captured four slices right and so as we evolve and as the grid evolves we could add more slices to this and it wouldn't change the fundamental um, requirement proposal or the counting rules um, and in fact, you would want to do the same analyses to capture when these loss of load hours are occurring. So we're doing this just based on a look of all the data we have between now and 2030. But if we get five years down the road and we need to add another slice, we can. But right now, there is no need to do that from a reliability perspective. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I know we're running a little bit over, but since Jeff and Bridget have been waiting patiently and it looks like we still have enough time, we'll just be eating into our end of the day Q&A. Uh, maybe I'll turn it to you, Jeff. Yeah, just, yeah, I thought I understood the answer, but the last comments confused me. Uh, I'm just trying to understand the mechanics of this. Is each LSE given two numbers 
they have to show a capacity quantity for the gross and a capacity quantity for the net. Is that showing with two numbers in it? You could think about it that way, or you could think about it as um, one showing where you make sure that your resources can meet both requirements. I mean, you okay. can't double count megawatts. Just like in yours, for example, you have a, an hourly requirement and you're, you could have one stack that meets all 24 hours, or maybe you're going to require a showing of 24 stacks to meet 24 hours. I think the mechanics of the showings haven't been worked out yet. Yeah. And one other thing I'd add, Jeff, is that um, this part of what we're trying to leverage the concepts of this is already happening for the net peak assessment um, under local RA today. We only submit one showing, as you know, the NQC values uh, for those resources, and the CAISO performs that sufficiency assessment. And uh, the, this proposal is analogous to that, where the CPUC would perform the assessment. And if the CPUC would take into consideration um, historical output, so as not to so as to ensure overcounting during this period that is being um, tested doesn't occur. Okay, so again, I'm just trying to get mechanics on this. So in my mind, you've got two numbers you've got to hit, a gross peak and a net peak. Now, do you show different sets of resources, and do the resources have different NQCs, or have you eliminated no. NQC in this proposal for the two showings? Is it one showing, but the two points of the showing, do the resources have different NQCs? Um, I'll speak for myself um, and then have Carrie clarify since um, it's the Gridwell framework, but my thinking on this requirement, there are two requirements for different slices. However, you could think of it much more simply as a gross requirement with a nested net peak requirement. So I'll just throw, I think like September 8th of 2021 had a gross peak of roughly 41,000 and a net peak of a net managed peak of, of let's say 30 something. Um, it is a lower quantity that and in the and I'm being I'm, I'm being um, kind of non-specific because we haven't landed. We've talked about like four or five different options to get to that net peak amount. But once you land on your approach, it's going to be something smaller than the gross peak requirement. It is a nested requirement is one way to think of it. So the amount of resources needed to meet it, um, yes, there may be less, but the requirement itself is also less. Um, but, but it's but, not. But the resources are changing their capabilities, especially if the sun's gone down between those two periods. So are, are you changing the NQC of resources for those two points? Yeah, oh, and maybe of renewable resources only, yeah. only wind mm -hmm. and solar. Solar will be zero or extremely limited, depending yeah. on what methodology for this is the just I just want to take a step back, Jeff, and say um, we cannot disconnect resource counting from the requirement methodology. And as Kathleen outlined, we're still considering multiple net requirement methodologies. So depending on what path we went down, the resource counting rules could end up almost nearly the same um, or it could end up being zero for solar. You have a large range there, but we don't want to, but the, the functionally, um, you would have one list and maybe you'd have two NQCs for renewables, or maybe you'd have one. It depends on how you define the requirement. And then if you add new slices down the road, additional NQCs. Uh, if, exactly. you have a, if you have a four hour use limited resource that you kind of need it to meet the hours around your gross peak, can you count that for meeting both your gross peak and your net peak? even though it's only available for one? So if you have a, a four hour requirement, yeah, your ELCC would discount it significantly across, and that ELCC would be across the entire day. So at least as an initial proposal, I would propose to have one NQC for that. Mm -hmm. and okay. One uh, okay, at least I get it, but boy, that, that's a, boy, I, that, that introduces a lot of inefficiency. If you have a resource so that's capable- I wanna pause there and say, it. I, I really, um, I struggle when um, a couple of people have said that it introduces an inefficiency. In my mind, there is less inefficiency in doing a loss of load expectation study in an ELC study with the same assumptions across 24 hours than doing 24 individual slices 
where you're doing an exceedance methodology up to an arbitrary number. I mean, we could argue about which framework introduces more um, inefficiency, but I think, um, you know, if we're talking about trying to find the perfect solution, Jeff, I don't think there is one, but I think this certainly introduces a lot less inefficiency than the exceedance methodology. I just think baseline, ELCC is more efficient than exceedance. Okay, I just still have a lot of misunderstanding or, or lack of uh, figuring out the mechanics on how many ELCCs, how many NQCs, how you make sure resources aren't double counted. So if there's more information, I'd look forward to seeing it. Thank you. Yeah, and I and, and thank you, Jeff, and can certainly do that. I think part of why it's, and I will emphasize my vision of the net peak is the showings, it's a single NQC value. It is a single show in the sufficiency check that the CAISO does uses historical output, but it's not something that an LSE or a sub seller shows. So we can provide more detail on that if that's needed. But I think your question itself is adding complexity to this proposal that doesn't exist in our current framework. And we're largely proposing to align with what local is um, or flex to kind of align it to how local is being done today. Thanks. All right, let's uh, wrap up the session with, with Bridget. Um, maybe let's try to close by 2.15 so we can turn it over to pg &E. well, uh, Two things One is, um, obviously this is similar to what Kaiso had put out in the past, um, but I just wanted to say that internally we're still discussing whether this is a durable framework for the long term. So when we initially proposed this kind of framework, we were, we're thinking about 2022, 2023, you know, the next couple of years. And so, um, you know, just wanted to kind of throw it out there that, you know, we're still discussing if this is something we would support for a long-term reform. Um, second is, obviously the, this proposal relies a lot on ELCC. And right now the ELCC values still capture a lot of the gross peak contributions of solar. So I'll just take solar as an example. Um, but as we move in time, um, the ELCC values obviously go to zero because the loss of load expectations are getting pulled towards non-solar hours. And so I'm wondering if we might get into a mismatch or this proposal will lead to the undervaluing of solar for that peak load requirement check if it's based on ELCC because the ELCC is getting pulled towards the gross load. And so really it's undercounting, like it it solves the, like the net load check solves the current problem of solar being overvalued at, you know, 8 p.m. when we know there's no solar. Um, but under this framework here, I wonder if in the future we'll be undercounting the value of solar because the ELCC values are really driven by all the loss of load expectations are in the non-solar hours, but um, you know those resources are still contributing to peak. So just kind of thinking through like long term, you know how ELCC values might change um, as the resource mix changes. Does this framework make sense in the long run? Yeah, yeah, that's actually a great question and um, brings up something that I forgot to mention in this. So one, um, ELCC, I think even going forward, will capture the value of um, its contribution to reliability um, in all hours. But then I think it'll further it'll further capture its value during peak because as solar is needed to charge batteries, even though ELCC starts going down, it'll start creeping up again. So as we rely on solar in the ELCC studies to charge batteries, um, that actually is taken into account within the ELCC and it starts getting additional capacity value. Um, so it won't go to zero under our existing, you know, battery solar construct. Um, just kind of uh, response back to that. So I was at the Future Powers Forum yesterday and uh, talking about ELCC, and there's an interesting chart where um, it was, you know, comparing the interaction effects between solar and storage, and um, it brings up the question of how you distribute those benefits. So um, while, yes, having more storage did increase the value of 
um, solar, a lot of that value was captured in the storage ELCC, but without the solar there, that storage's ELCC value would be lower. So I think another problem we might run into the future is how to distribute those benefits uh, or those capacity values kind of fairly across those two resources. Um, so maybe one thing to think about is like, how could we get ELCC for better capture the interaction of tax and values across the different um, resource classes? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, I think that will be, you know, one of the, as Kathleen said, you know, we'd propose to update the ELCCs no less than every two years. Um, and allocating that diversity benefit um, should be a significant portion of that. I mean, especially once you have the studies up and running, those very questions, I think, are what should inform capacity values going forward. And, and we have some time before that happens. So certainly, I think, should be addressed. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think we need to cut it off at this point because uh, we need to be sure we have enough time for PG&E and NRDC. Um, so you know, uh, next up is, I don't know if it's Peter or Luke or another colleague at PG&E. Uh, are you guys ready to present? We have you know, 30 minutes, give or take. Um, we can always do a little more time for Q&A, but let's make 30, 30 minutes the bogey if we can. That, that sounds good, Jen. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. OK, uh, and um, thank you for uh, the discussion and the, uh, the chance to uh, um, present. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit from where we picked up uh, last time uh, in terms of um, need determination and allocation. We talked about some options uh, last time. We're going to be talking uh, this time around uh, essentially things that we think should probably be features and how it should work. So uh, Luke, let's go to the next slide. Um, this slide is safety orientation. We're used to basically starting out the day in presenting and we didn't start out today and, and provide a safety message. Um, certainly um, safety is always on top of everybody's minds or should be, uh, and that includes sort of uh, uh, mental health and, and well-being as well. So um, please make sure, um, you know, these days of workshops are can be very exhausting. So please make sure that you take care of yourself from a mental health aspect. So uh, next slide, please. Um, generally, uh, these are the principles. We've started out sort of all of our presentations with talking about what the principles are. These are the principles I think were just discussed, or at least Kathleen was referencing in terms of what is in the decision uh, that the, that the uh, commission put out uh, in July. Uh, and that is basically balancing reliable grid with minimizing cost, balancing address, uh, addressing hourly sufficiency with advancing environmental goals, uh, balancing granularity and meeting hourly needs with simplicity and transactability, uh, and and uh, also being implementable in the in the relatively short term, uh, and also to be durable in the long run in terms of not having to make changes going forward. Um, so you know we review these sort of every time just to remind people sort of what the direction has been from the commission. Uh, I think that there are various aspects and various ways to do this balancing, and it's good to have. I think explicit discussions about sort of how things balance. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, our key objectives um, for th this discussion and objectives um, uh, are basically to try and um, look at sort of the over and under procurement risk and how that how that is um, you know how that is minimizing cost to customers. Also, the administrative complexity. Uh, how hard is this going to be to implement and um, and uh, to basically to to do the showings uh, both on the LSE side as well as on the PUC energy division side uh, of things. Uh, so all of these things need to be taken into account. Uh, fair cost allocation, I think, is also a a contribution. Uh, as we heard earlier from Lynn, there is a very wide diversity of uh, of LSE load shapes. Uh, and to, to some degree, the question is, is are the LSE load shapes and the, and the requirements of the LSEs being adequately reflected in what the RA requirements are? Uh, and finally, uh, you know, alignment across proceedings. Um, certainly, there's been uh, some discussion or discussion about how the RA proceeding needs to be aligning with the, R, uh, the IRP proceeding. Uh, we think that this is important. We think that there are some very, um, very strong crossover uh, methodologies for for, for doing that, 
Uh, some of those are probably not unlike what uh, was just presented by Gridwell and Vistra in terms of doing LOLE analyses and how those LOLE analyses will be done and where. I won't be getting into a whole lot of detail there at this point. Um, we did go through some of that last time in terms of the way we thought that should work. Uh, we do see essentially LOLE uh, analyses um, being a regular part of the RA program going forward, uh, something that should be done on a, on a regular cadence. Um, so let's go now, now to the next slide. Um, in terms of talking about particulars of the forecast and the need determination. Um, need as they, it is currently being done is based on load and LSE's load. So um, it depends really very much on what the forecasts are. So next slide, please. The forecast, what we're recommending at this point is to do a, um, a one in two load forecast. Um, and largely that's, uh, that's because of a couple of different things. Um, first of all, it's what we have been using uh, and, and um, it is something that uh, is well known. It's used across some proceedings uh, and, and is used in ways that needs to be, to, to be thought of. However, um, you could be moving to something a little more conservative, say a one in five forecast. Uh, a one in five forecast um, would require uh, a bit differently, a bit, a bit, a bit of differentiation, and we would have to think about and had, and the commission would have to try and coordinate how that one in five would be used, or or something more stringent would be used. Um, need to sort of understand the the fact that the the level of of loss of load forecast that you're using will have an impact on the reliability studies in terms of the LOLE studies. Uh, if you use a one in two forecast, you're basically saying that you're looking at sort of what the what sort of the 50 per, uh, percentile is of the possible uh, distribution of loads could be. If you're using a one in five, you're using a, a much higher percentage. So you're essentially capturing more of that load uh, load variation, uh, essentially using a higher forecast. Um, and so changing to a one in five would require uh, a bunch of coordination and uh, and and discussion with other relevant uh, stake uh, other proceedings and making sure that the, there is a consistent look at this. Um, and this would be done, um, you know, certainly in, in in coordination with what's going on in the other proceedings. Um, need determination. Uh, there are a couple of different options that have been talked about need determination. pg e has put forward in the past a sort of looking at things on a maximum hourly basis. So um, so that if you're looking at a, a season slice or a monthly slice, um, it would be essentially the maximum demand uh, sort of within that slice that would set the requirement for uh, for all this for the entire slice for all hours or that would be in that slice. Um, it would be also based on sort of what the IRP um, ISO level hourly forecast should be uh, on that. It wouldn't be necessarily on an on a essentially an LSE by LSE basis in terms of what the maximum is, but essentially what the the system is. Um, and the highest value in the season would set the requirement uh, for the season. Um, and for the slice, um, you know, this is again something that I think we've talked about in the past. Uh, as an illustration, if we move to the next slide, uh, I can get into uh, sort of examples of this. So, next slide, please. Uh, on the right side here, you can see if we have a a season that's defined as um, June, July, August, September, and October. Say, if you have a five month season and you have essentially uh, a a four hour slice, you have six four hour slices in that. It's essentially the maximum, uh, and again, what's what's in this data in this table is what's the maximum um, the maximum uh, uh, um, value that is in the forecast for that uh, for that uh, essentially typical day. So if I'm looking at June, if I'm looking at Jan January, in all of the in all of the hour endings one what basically is the maximum value is in that hour ending one across all the days within January. That's the value that is sitting up there in the in the upper left hand corner, which I believe is uh, what is that? 24, 420, uh, 424. Um, and so you would essentially look at that maximum value and then essentially to set the requirement for the slice that that hour is in in the typical day, 
you would essentially go to the maximum value, um, which in this particular case, in that first slice, would be um, you know at the 25,784 value. Um, so it's basically looking at the maximum values with what's in the forecast for the for the season, for the particular hour, and then how you've got these the slice defined would be the maximum value of that. And so it wouldn't necessarily be on the same day um, in terms of when you would have that uh, have that um, value uh, using a maximum or a worst day type of framework, um, you have to have some sort of a criteria to define what that maximum, what that worst day is. Um, this methodology essentially says, we're gonna take the worst of the worst in every hour and use that as the basis of the requirement. Uh, also on the left side, you can see that the, it's the sort of the maximum value within that within that slice that sets the requirement. So it's it's not essentially each of the um, each of the hourly values, but essentially what is the maximum, and that would be the requirement for each uh, for each of the slices. Um, so uh, next next slide, please. I did want to talk about PRM and how PRM fits into this and where things are with the planning reserve margin. Uh, we did talk about uh, this more extensively in the last workshop, uh, and there is a process uh, which essentially is an LOLE type of process where the idea for the most part is you would essentially um, uh, have a target level of reliability and then essentially use an LOLE analysis to be able to uh, fine tune essentially what the values are, what the requirements are that would be able to hit that level of reliability. So let's go to the um, to the first uh, to the next slide. Generally, we're thinking about a planning reserve margin type of uh, of framework um, where it would be based on it would be applied to essentially the load forecast uh, um, in terms of what the load forecast was for what the what the load requirements are. And it would include uh, very explicitly a 6% uh, operating reserve. Um, and this is largely because of the fact that the operating reserve is, uh, is something that the ISO needs to be able to operate the system. It's capacity that has to be reserved to be able to serve a level of load. And so we want to make sure that that is explicitly built in and explicitly um, part of the requirement that is set for the, how the requirements are, are, are set. We're also thinking that there needs to be um, perhaps consideration and terms for a number of the other aspects, uh, including the outage rates. Um, you know, certainly outage rates, uh, this is in, in, in the discussion we had in the last workshop. If you're using UCAP as a measurement of, uh, of forced outages, um, that could be one way of moving essentially a something that's in the planning reserve margin or would be in the planning reserve margin into essentially a a measurement of what the what the value is in terms of the contribution. Um, and so as you can see, there is this ability to is it in the requirement um, in terms of the way you're measuring things in terms of where the uncertainty is, or is it in the, the setting of the requirement and putting in some buffer for some of the uncertainty that you are um, that you're assuming when you essentially set things like um, counting requirements or counting, I'm sorry, level of level of counting for resources. Um, similarly, for demand variability, um, you know, demand. If we are picking a one and two uh, load forecast, uh, then there should there will be uh, load variability. The question is, is how much do we want to try and explicitly cover? Uh, in thinking about what that uncertainty is and how that uncertainty works. Um, and finally, um, resource variability. Again, these things need to be determined again based on sort of what the counting requirements are and how the counting requirements would work and what they would and what they might be. Um, and so all of these things would yet to be determined and they would be determined really based on what we start nailing down in terms of things like, how you're measuring what the contribution is and in, in of the resource to providing uh, energy in each of the slices. Um, the PR determination process, um, I, we talked about this last time. I'm not going to go into, we haven't put a lot of detail out in this, in this presentation, largely because we talked about it in the last presentation where 
you would really want to be able to essentially have the a an established a level of reliability which is essentially a very particular loss of load expectation in terms of how the loss of load expectations um, is is set uh, and then essentially from there um, you would you would want to then look at the resource mix that you have and how you're applying the county rules to that resource mix the load of the how you're looking at the load in terms of the load distribution you want to use, whether the forecast is. You would also then think about, um, uh, you know, sort of what the, you know, what the planning reserve margin is. And the thought for the most part from PG&E's perspective is, you know, once we would like to be able to fix things and fix things certain things for a long period of time. And what I mean by fix things is sort of the slice and season structure. If we fix that and we fix the county rules, those are probably the things you don't want to be changing on a year to year basis, largely because that would hamper and inhibit essentially long term contracting. If you want to have a lot of long term contracting, uh, you, it's better essentially to have greater certainty about what things will count uh, in the future. And so setting the setting the structure and the counting, the counting um, requirements essentially are the two things that are probably uh, most important for having a stable contracting structure in the long run. The level of load in terms of whether it be a one and two or a one and five, that plays a picture, but also then is the planning reserve margin. And so the idea is, is that you would set these things, you would then essentially look at the resource mix and what the counting was, you would then essentially see uh, with a particular PRM, whether or not um, that that provided the level of reliability to the system uh, in, in terms of getting to that um, that level of that loss of load of expectation, and if your reliability essentially it's providing too much reliability, you may think about saying with that particular PRM you may want to lower the PRM to be able to get there. Uh, alternatively, you would you if you if you're having or looking at things and essentially not getting to the level of reliability that you would like, you would increase the PRM. And so, what you would be doing uh, in these adjustments, and we see these as being regular adjustments that would be done in the RA program through analysis, um, either on uh, I don't know necessarily on an annual basis, but on a on a biannual basis for sure, in terms of being able to adjust that. Uh, PRM so that you make sure that you're getting the right quantity of, of capacity procured and per capacity, per ca uh, of capacity procured to be able to um, to be able to essentially meet that level of reliability. Um, there has been some discussion about PRM variation and whether it would be very vari variable and how it would be variable. From PG&E's perspective, we're trying to keep things relatively simple. Um, we don't see a compelling reason necessarily to vary things, the PRM, uh, either seasonally or monthly, depending upon how it's set up. Uh, however, it's something that, um, you know, if there's shown to be a compelling reason to do that, but some, certainly something that we would consider adopting and putting in um, into the right aspect. So um, with that, um, let me move to the next slide where we're going to essentially move away from need determination to allocation. And allocation essentially is once the requirements are set, how are those requirements set um, at a system level? How are they uh, cascaded down or cascaded to LSEs? So um, next slide, please. Um, from PG&E's perspective, uh, what, we're, what we're thinking for the most part is that we um, keeping a, a, an existing gross hybrid process that was um, in terms of setting the requirements and setting that as was described earlier, um, in terms of there being a system forecast that, that is checked against sort of a built up forecast of the LSEs. Um, we see this being done um, not so much on a monthly basis, on a monthly peak basis, but actually being done uh, on an hourly basis or at least potential for an hourly basis to be able to try and get uh, as uh, you know, load shapes, LSE load shapes um, uh, on a on an individual load shape uh, LSE basis. Um, it was good to hear from Lynn that, um, earlier this morning that that is something that seems to be doable uh, from a CEC perspective. Uh, I will note that there are think I, I think that um, for the most part. Um, that would be that would be uh, something that we would we would want to try and do and facilitate with the CEC. So 
whatever information that that the CEC needs to be able to facilitate that, we would want to try and uh, have uh, have parties essentially in this in the PUC essentially work to provide that information. Um, the application of the existing gross peak then um, would be you know could be pre preliminary and, and sort of allocation would then be done. Um, also, PG&E uh, sort of at this point is recommending that we think about things less on a uh, uh, less on a net basis and more on a gross basis. Um, we and this is regardless of sort of how we're looking at um, the the size of the slices or or the largeness of the slices, largely because of the fact that we're adding more re reporting requirements on LSEs if we go to a net load type of basis for doing an allocation. Uh, in particular. Uh, each LSE would have to, if you're going to do things on a net load basis and have that be done on a net load basis, uh, what you would have to be doing would be essentially a a multiple rounds of showings or at least two rounds of showings where each LSE would have to indicate what uh, renewable resources it had contracted for and report that to the PUC, to Energy Division, so the Energy Division could take that into account along with the load forecast of that LSE to be able to then essentially set the requirement that would within that then would have to be procured to. Uh, and then it gets to the question of well, what happens to renewable resources that were not procured and not shown to be able to reduce the need? Are they then still available to essentially to meet that re requirement need or not? Uh, again, from PG&E's perspective, that's adding a whole nother um, reporting cycle of what contracts uh, LSEs have, and that's something that we would rather uh, rather avoid uh, sort of at this stage of the game and moving in this transition. So um, with that, I think that is my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions people have. Thanks, Peter. And for those who want to ask questions, um, raise your hand, join the queue. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Peter. This is Mark Specht with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, on your uh, slide about the PRM, you, I, I just, I'm just wondering, what's the value in splitting up the PRM into operating reserves and outage rates? Like at the end of the day, aren't we just doing an LOLE study that tells us how much capacity we need to meet the LOLE standard? And the PRM in totality is just determined by that LOLE study. And I'm not sure, I'm struggling to see the value in like continuing to split up the PRM into these separate buckets with operating reserves and outage rates, et cetera. Well, I, for the most part, it's really trying to, um, um, Mark, it's really, I, I, our thinking to some degree, it's really trying to basically be very explicit about sort of how are we thinking about the PRM? What uncertainty is there that we're trying to take into account in that PRM? Now, um, it's, you know, the LOLE studies, uh, you're basically saying just have one number be, be the PRM. Uh, from our perspective, we know whatever the load forecast is that the ISO is going to need resources very explicitly to operate to meet that load. And so that should be part of it. It should either be part of the load forecast, which I don't think it currently is, or it needs to be explicitly called out. And so it's those types of things where it's not uncertainty that will be determined by the um, essentially by the uh, by the by an LOLE type of, of study. It'll be essentially it, it it is it is essentially resources that are needed by the ISO to operate the system. Um, in terms of in terms of why to break it out, we're thinking to some degree if you go to something like a UCAP structure. A UCAP structure will essentially um, affect the counting rules that you're using. Um, there will still be, you know, whatever the counting rules are, you're still in the in the LOLE analysis. You're still assuming that the full full capacity of that of that resource is going to be available in that study. And so the question is, is do you need to be able to, um, you know, should you be thinking about what uncertainty is in there and how that is in there? I mean, in the last presentation, we just saw a proposal that. Hey, that hey, there's a real, a real operational uh, uncertainty about whether storage is actually going to be operated in the way that it could be op op optimally, and we shouldn't be thinking in the in the LOLE type of analysis where it is assumed for the most part the the storage will be operated uh, optimally, all resources will be operated optimally. 
that, oh, wait a second, if we rely on that and that's not what actually happens, we need to build something in for that. And so it's really just a way to be, it's really, in, in my mind, Mark, it's really just a way to be very clear about what are we explicitly trying to take into account where? Uh, are we taking it into account in the in the per planning reserve margin, or are we taking it into account in, say, something like the counting rules? Is that, okay. is that helpful? Yeah, thanks, Peter. That makes sense. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Paul? Hi, this is Paul Nelson on behalf of Clica. Just a quick sound check if people can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, Paul. Great. So you mentioned, I think, on the prior slide to this, about the possibility of using the one in five or perhaps even one in 10 as the, as the load target. Yep. If you do that, then does, doesn't that also then affect the planning reserve margin? Yes, it will. Absolutely. And that and that's why and that's why to some degree those things and, and that's why we don't sort of say what the planning reserve margin will be. It's saying once we decide what those things are, then you have to do the analysis of the to of the LOLE to be able to to tell you what the planning reserve margin should be, because you're going to need you're probably going to need a smaller planning reserve margin with a one in five load uh, forecast than you are with a one in two load forecast. Yeah, that would be my expectation as well. I mean, because yeah. the planning reserve margin study is going to look at a bunch of stochastic loads, which are going to have weather profiles that are cooler than a one and yep. two. Of course, you don't yep. really care about those. You really care about the ones that are, you know, above the one and two, um, toward like the one and 10, you know, above the average, I should say. Yep. Um, and I haven't really thought about how you would adjust the planning reserve margin steady if you're using all those stochastic load profiles. No. Oh. Um, I guess the way I thought about it, Paul, is that you would it would be to some degree an iterative process that you would yeah. set the require you would set the what you're what you're shooting for and sort of how you're counting things to shoot for that and um, and what the structure is and essentially use that as the basis of then okay tell me what my level my LOLE is uh, with a certain level of PRM if it's if my LOLE basically gives me lower reliability than I want I'm going to have to raise my PRM. And then I would I would raise it and essentially do a study or you know do do another LOLE to see how closely I've gotten to my target level of reliability. Um, it, it it's an iterative process to some degree. Once you start nailing these things down, to be able to set that a PRM. And I guess from PG&E's perspective, it's important to say, hey, the PRM is the is the thing that will affect the quantity that is procured and required to be procured. And that's the easiest thing to adjust rather than thinking about adjusting uh, resource counting or what the structure is or anything, any of the other aspects of what goes into that. Yeah, uh, so this, this discussion then also applies to whether you utilize, implement a UCAP. That's correct, well. absolutely. Absolutely, and, that, and that's that's why on the PRM slide we had here, it really depends upon what you're assuming about how how it'll set up and how it'll work, yeah. and in terms of in terms of nailing down some of those other aspects and those those other parameters. All right, thanks, Peter. Sure. All right, thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks, Paul. <clears throat> Kathleen. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, this is Kathleen Colbert. Um, you may have explain this to Mark, so I may ask you, be asking you to repeat it again, but I just wanted to confirm on the PRM, the uncertainty one, uh, components, that slide. Um, should I understand this as the LOLE study provides us the generation that we need to meet our, our threshold, a reliability threshold, um, which implicitly includes these rates, or are you thinking more of a deterministic PRM that would be looking at like historical performance or outcomes for each of those. No, I'm going to say the way the way we're thinking about this is is not to rely on history to sort of say mm -hmm. what have they been in the past. Mm -hmm. That that might be a good starting point to sort of say, oh, if we assume these things. But it, no, it has to the PRM has to adjust through the LOLE uh, type of analysis. And I, and I think okay. that's to some degree, Kathleen. That was the point mm -hmm. you were making in the last presentation. Is yeah. is 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 that hey. We need to make sure we're hitting the level of reliability and with the assumptions that we've got. Uh, and so, and so, um, you know, that's got to be a part of the way of this RA reform. And, and I, and you know, and PG&E agrees with that. 
Uh, no, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, this sounds pretty consistent generally uh, with uh, what we were thinking, and I wanted to make sure that that I was getting the right takeaway. Yep. Um, so yep. thanks. All right. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I, I, Jen, I saw a lot of a lot of comments come up in the chat when I was talking, but I paid no attention to them. I'm assuming that didn't have anything to do with my presentation. Yeah, a lot of comments here and that. I don't see any particular questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, we could always revisit them. Peter, you could take a look at the chat and then and come back to it toward the end. Okay. Yep. Happy thanks, to do Peter. so. All right. Well, thanks, Peter, for timely and, and insightful presentation. Um, and last but not least, wanted to uh, have the final presenter uh, come up to the stage, uh, Nick from NRDC. Um, take it away. I think you got about 30 minutes, and, and give or take, we could uh, be a little flexible on time. Great. Thanks a lot, Jen. Um, let me just check. Is my uh, presentation showing for everybody here? Yes. Great. All right, let me just get this oriented here. So, uh, hi everybody, Nick Pappas on behalf of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, really great discussion thus far from everybody. Thank you. Uh, this next presentation is really going to be about this IRP RA integration element and calibration. Uh, there's going to be a fair amount of overlap, I think, with some of the discussion from Kathleen and the Vista presentation, as well as, as uh, PG&E, some sort of related themes that are going to come up here, but hopefully uh, hopefully this will add to the discussion and not just uh, wear away at everybody at the end of the day here. Um, so let me go ahead and jump in. First off, as a disclaimer, this is uh, our my work with NRDC is uh, preliminary for policy development, and I'm here as an independent consultant. This you know really is for discussion purposes, and uh, we want to get your feedback. If you know you all tell me that we've got this totally wrong, this may not be what we ultimately file in regulatory comments. I, I can only hope the discussion will be as, uh, as spicy as the comments section in terms of that feedback. Uh, so, so first off, I want to add a couple of level setting slides to sort of frame up where we're at in this in this process. So first, you know, why are we here? We're we're here to figure out how to take something really complex, which is the energy system. Arguably, you know, people call it the most complex machine on earth. Um, and we're taking it through a moment where it's getting increasingly complex. We're adding a lot of new resources with new operational constraints and making a lot of changes. And we're trying to take all of those operational needs and convert them into a set of compliance requirements, simple enough to be on a spreadsheet, that we can pass around to dozens or maybe low hundreds uh, of market participants who are all competing economically to get them to come back to us with a, a showing, a, or a set of showings that gets us to this reliable portfolio that can make the grid work. Now, that's a, a big challenge, obviously, as we've discussed today. I think there are some things that are going to mitigate how complex that challenge is. Having information about the existing fleet, the planned upcoming resources makes that much easier, but it's still a, it's a tough challenge. As part of that, we need to think about how to create these tools that meet the other commission goals adopted in this decision and held from longstanding uh, RA policy, things like preventing leaning between LSEs, thinking about new upcoming constraints, figuring out how to a way to incorporate new emerging resources that have very different operating characteristics than what we've worked with historically. Um, and really thinking about this as a much more multidimensional problem than we have historically with the kind of unidimensional uh, RA program. So the moving it on to this, I want to talk a little bit about how this fits in with our longer term planning constructs and LSE requirements in the IRP and how we can use these two together to calibrate that accounting structure to try to emulate that complex grid. So Stepping back, we continue to support the month hour slice of day framework. This presentation is going to be focused around calibration on a month hour framework, but I really think that this structure that we're bringing, bringing forward here is, is fairly generalizable to other, other constructs uh, similar to what Kathleen presented for Vistra for the two slice por portfolio. Um, but I want to flag one thing that I think is really critical here that sets this apart from some of the other proposals. 
is over the last couple of years, as LSEs were submitting their IRPs, and this is relevant to some of the comment discussion thus far, there was a great deal of confusion between LSEs of what it meant to show a reliable portfolio, particularly when it comes to existing resources. So setting aside the procurement mandates, LSEs really didn't have any guidance from the commission on what they needed to show either near term or long term to be you know, reliable in the eyes of the IRP proceeding. And a big impetus for this RA reform, in addition to getting the RA showings to be right, was to build a tool that the IRP could adopt and give LSEs a framework to think about next year, five years, 10 years out, how do they think about their specific LSEs contributions or lack thereof to reliability and some sort of metric that is transparent to LSEs that they can have prior to the submission so that the commission you know, doesn't come back six months or a year later and say, hey, your filing was insufficient on reliability, but we don't have a metric. So part of this process is to give that metric and that tool to be incorporated alongside other IRP tools for LSEs. So let me present briefly a quick structural proposal on how IRP and RA can be integrated. I, I have no doubt that this is going to be maybe intuitive for some and very confusing for others. So I'm going to try to go both quickly but, but thoroughly through this and I would invite any clarifying questions as I go through here. So big picture just to the last discussion with pg and &E and Vistra is the PRM, it's, it's a balancing act, right? All of this parameterization within RA is a balancing act. And at the end of the day, all that really matters is we get showings from LSEs that all together come together with a portfolio of resources that is reliable for CAISO to run actual dispatch under future conditions. No matter what we change, there's imbalances that are gonna exist. If we change how solar is counted in one construct versus the other, it's gonna change the PRM. If we change the load forecast in one versus the other, it's gonna change the PRM. And the only way to really understand this and to figure out what the right calibration is, is through LOLE analysis. I think this is this horse has been beaten thoroughly um, during today's workshop, and I don't need to, to reiterate that, but it's really critical that we don't think of any of these constructs as inherently understanding how you can produce a reliable system. No spreadsheet can tell you how you're going to have a reliable system. The reliability testing and calibration all has to occur outside of this framework through an LOLE analysis to bring parameterization and calibration back into this, again, simplified accounting structure for LSEs. And what I'm going to talk through on the next few slides is how we can do that on a much more regular basis than we've been doing historically. So let's dive into the process. Big picture, I envision this as four steps. And again, this is targeted to the, the 24 slice proposal from SCE, but it's really generalizable, I think, across any of these proposals. The first step is an LOLE based needs determination. This is using an LOLE model to determine what's the desired portfolio largely consisting of existing resources if it's you know one or two years out, plus what we know is coming out of the system. What's the desired portfolio we want to get? And we can do this in the IRP process. And the only real modification here is to add more near-term analysis to the IRP that's calibrated to a reliability standard that we can then use for an RA comparison. The second piece is taking that portfolio and notice that I'm not saying take the PRM and transfer it over. I'm saying take the portfolio from IRP and then translate it into the RA construct. So using that framework, whatever counting rules you've determined, whatever compliance requirements you've determined, you apply that set of resources and then determine what adjustments are necessary, preferably to the PRM, to get showings from all LSDs that are equivalent to the desired portfolio that you're going to get. Um, now, there's a lot of different flavors here, depending if you top down, bottom up, et cetera, et cetera. But big picture, this is the construct that works kind of no matter which approach you take. The fourth step, and this has come up a fair amount, is LSCs may not show exactly their share of that system portfolio. There may be some diversity in showings and there may be some benefits to that diversity. And we need to think about, to the extent we have information to do so, how can we incorporate that expected diversity into this PRM calibration? And through that, and I think we need to be doing this on a very frequent basis, you can start to think about how you get both um, fairly precisely calibrated uh, requirements year to year, and also pretty good forecast for LSEs multiple years into the future about what their requirements are likely to be, you know, subject to some refinement. 
So the first step again is getting a needs determination through an LOE study. Uh, and what I'm going to suggest is that we, using the existing tools we have in the IRP or if the IRP tools evolve, can do this on a very regular basis, yearly or every other year, and do, do it with some forecasts out into the future that are going to be subject to refinement as we get more information about the resource build out. So really not that different than what we do today. It's about determining whatever the re uh, reference system portfolio or preferred system portfolio is that's going to meet our desired reliability standard. So here's just a hypothetical of how we might want to, to schedule this. Uh, let's think about the upcoming IRP cycles. We have the 21 to 22 IRP, 23 to 24, and so on and so on, assuming we stick with a two-year program. So I would envision, this is a conceptual proposal here, in this upcoming 21-22 uh, IRP cycle, we can determine both uh, the preferred portfolio we want to get out of the IRP, and consequently we want to drive the RA showings to look like, final requirements for 2024, that's when slice of day is supposed to be implemented, as well as some preliminary calibration and really useful information for LSEs for the next subsequent three years for them to drive both their new build procurement as well as long-term contracting. Something that I'll say from the LSE perspective, as I understand it, is sorely lacking in today's RA framework, frameworks. Any sort of durability or sense of what's upcoming in the future. That's complicated for a few reasons. It's not just the framework. There's also complexities with CPE and CAM, et cetera, et cetera. But this will give a lot more transparency than I think exists today. Um, and then moving forward, you can think about in the subsequent IRP cycle, you can do final requirements or refinements of those past, past um, forecast needs and sort of continue as you get closer and closer to the actual compliance year, continue to refine these and, and provide those forecasts to LSEs based on the information we have in, in these uh, ex ante years. So let's think about how we go from the IRP portfolio to what we want to see from the RA fleet. Right? We don't have an RA program and we're not going to have an RA program that's going to direct LSEs to go procure specific resources. But if you think about IRP showings, you think about CAM and CPE procurement, much of which is multi-year, and the potential, which is teed up later in this workshop series, to establish a, a multi-year requirement for specific LSEs, we're going to have a pretty good set, set of information about what we anticipate LSEs are going to show in future years based on those showings. We may not have a great sense of like five years out, but we're gonna have a pretty good sense of one to two years out. And that's really critical as we think about this LOLE analysis is we're not starting from a blank slate where we're gonna build 50,000 megawatts of proxy demand response. Like we know basically what the resource mix is gonna be in the next year. And that's critical that we take that information and plug that into the LOLE analysis and think about what we need to get in these RA showings but there's gonna be some residual position. Um, and this is a simplification or generalization here, but I think it's safe to think that the vast majority of the preferred resources are likely to be under longer, longer term RA contracts that will be you know, coming up in the IRP filings. And a lot of that residual position is gonna be met with conventional resources, potentially fossil imports, et cetera. And as we think about that calibration, we need to think about how do we get LSEs to the extent that's what the system has shown to need to actually show those resources. So this is, um, again, it's about slice of day here, but I think it's generalizable. If you think about a really simplified system showing, this is a super simple kind of illustrative version of a September profile, we know that all of these resources on top, solar, wind, storage, you know, most of these are under longer term contract with LSEs and they're going to pop up in our data set, whether it's from the IRP or multi-year RA showings or whatever we have. And as we think about adjusting the PRM up or down, and here I'm using the term PRM to refer to just a load adjustment on every hour, what that's really going to drive is a change in this residual firm resource showing at the bottom here. Um, I apologize to anyone who's having trouble kind of differentiating the colors here. But essentially what this is attempting to reflect is this PRM here, I've, I'm showing it at 10%, 15%, and 20%. Obviously, you know, <laughs> the refinement is hopefully gonna be a lot more granular than 5% increments. But as you go up or down in the PRM, what this drives is a residual mandatory showing that's gonna drive how much LSEs show of this residual resource set. 
So let's think about this as a kind of iterative increment decrement process, just like is done in you know, any LOLE study, you're adding or removing resources to get the desired quantity of showing to meet your reliability standard, right? The difference here is we're, we're adding or lowering the PRM so that the RA showing meets what we think is necessary. So this is, uh, again, it's illustrative here, but if you look at 15% uh, under this example, we have a shortfall, you increment that to 17%, 17 and a quarter percent, and you get to this kind of just right quantity. And again, that just right quantity is the equivalence between what we've shown in the IRP through an LLE study to be reliable, then determined that we want as our desired RA portfolio. That's what you get under this very specific counting construct. And as we've discussed, any change to the counting construct is going to change the ultimate percentage of the PRM if that's the lever you're using to calibrate. So where this gets, I think, much more complex, and I want to say this is not just a function of slice of day. This, this issue exists today with the MCC buckets, but diversity in resource showings from LSEs can lead to some inefficiency and over procurement if it's not tackled through calibration. And again, this is not new or unique to slice of day. It exists with today's structure with the MCC buckets, but it will also exist in slice of day. And so what we can do if we want to get really sophisticated, I think we should do is think about all of that multi-year information we, we have or will have from LSEs and think about using something similar to what's done in the IRP today with IRP aggregation to do essentially RA showing aggregation where we think about, well, if LSE A is showing this set of preferred resources, this is its residual conventional resource need. We got to aggregate that up and see if that diversity is going to lead to significant over or under procurement and adjust the PRM accordingly. This works a lot better in a kind of multi-year RA construct, but I think with the information we have from the IRPs, it could work reasonably well um, with, you know, candidly some some guesswork. And again, this is this is not limited to this proposal. The same issue I think exists both in the current MCC world and frankly, in any of the proposals we're seeing, but it's a piece that I think should be tackled as part of this calibration exercise. Um, so again, this is just a little more detail on how that aggregation process could work to flag some of the diversity. It's not strictly load shape. It also could be what renewable and storage mix resources have, how much firm conventional resources they show. Um, there's a sort of system optimal level, kind of minimum resource showing. And if um, you aggregate this out to LSEs, if you've got one LSE that's really long on solar and one LSE that's really long on wind, you're not going to get to that same optimal outcome. So that's something that needs to be thought about and tackled through this process. Uh, and again, it's, it's not today done perfectly, and I think none of these construct can be done perfectly, but I think we need to make efforts to try to minimize the risk of significant over procurement in this case. So a few wrap up slides um, before we go into Q&A. Some key takeaways here is LOLE, I think, really needs to be the centerpiece of this process, kind of regardless of the framework we choose, right? Uh, and this is this is kind of like what we're doing right now is painful. I think we're all feeling the pain. We're all probably all feeling a little agitated because we're in the middle of open heart surgery on the RA program. And what we really need moving forward is preventative maintenance. And I think doing regular LOLE analysis through the IRP is the centerpiece of that, uh, of that preventative maintenance. Uh, I think the PRM really should be the critical tool here. If we can think of a accounting framework and rules that gives uh, resources approximately their approximates effectively their operational characteristics. We should move to a world where we don't have to be doing constant massive adjustments to resource counting. And I think our goal should be have some durability in resource counting, and to the extent that impacts the PRM, use that as the primary lever after we've done our best to accurately reflect those um, those operational characteristics. Uh, the third bullet point, we have a lot of information about future showings, and we should use that as we calibrate the program. I think this is a point Kathleen made as well, is that we really, we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from an NQC list. We're starting from known showings. We have a lot of information to work with. And then finally is, again, this is generalizable. We can do this with slice of day. We can do this with any different framework. We can adjust it to prevent over procurement while still getting the desired reliability portfolio. Um, 
So I think this is tying a little bit back to the earlier debate and discussion, which is if all of this is about targeting a specific constraint, why do we go through the rigmarole of creating 24 hourly slices and establishing these rules for LSEs? And I'm not going to go through this whole list because I think we're all exhausted and uh, probably ready for some fun discussion after this, but I want to tag a couple really important ones. So one is internal consistency and the dynamic nature of this for specific LSEs. So I've heard, you know, a lot of frustration both on the LSE side and the, the developer side of the arbitrary constraints that are the MCC buckets today. I think that's really the pair of the foil we need to be thinking about this in contrast to is the MCC buckets have no internal consistency for an LSE and you might have a totally different load shape in the system and have to go procure the system load shape for all your RA purposes based on the MCC buckets when in reality your energy procurement, your long term new build, whatever is totally different shape. And that's just frustrating, I think, for everybody. It also leads to a lack of durability in the counting structures. The second one, and I mentioned this earlier, is the need for some kind of planning tool for LSEs to work with as they move towards 2030. So when we talked about this earlier calibration, it was really in the context of you know one year ahead, there's not that much we can do to build new resources on the horizon. But if we're talking about LSEs submitting an IRP looking 10 years ahead, this is, a, I think, a really helpful tool for LSEs to be thinking about in their IRP submissions. How well am I aligning my capacity procurement to my actual need? Uh, preferred resource benefits. Preferred resource is really hard to count in RA. I think that's kind of why we're all here, right? They're multidimensional. It's not just a single capacity element with no other constraints. And that's really what's led to all of the frustration we have around the current construct, which is unidimensional and reliant on translating something really complex, the ELCC framework, into just a single point estimate for value. I think everybody, whether it's LSEs or preferred resource developers or environmental NGOs, we're all frustrated with that. And we need to think about how do we reflect those operational characteristics in a way that demand response and storage and VERs can participate effectively without getting penalized by this kind of single point estimate of what they can do in a multidimensional world. And then the, the final one I want to touch on is, is this concept of leaning. Um, and I, I've heard a lot of folks who are critical of the notion that we shouldn't have leaning in the RA program. I think that's a totally fair point. I'm all for, um, I, <laughs> I don't want to overstep my bounds and say regionalization here, but I'm all for the sort of concept of a macro grid can provide a lot of benefits in a very renewable heavy world, right? There's a lot of economic efficiency there. But the commission, as the policymakers, have made very clear that leaning between LSEs is really important to them, and they don't want to see leaning be a major piece of the RA program. And so when we think about how to address leaning to the extent the commission, as the policymakers, decide that's a priority, we need a construct that gives some internal check specific to LSE portfolios. So I'm going to wrap up with just a comparison here between the MCC buckets and the slice of day. So I think a lot of the discussion around slice of day is not so much a frustration with slice of day, it's a frustration with being forced to shape your RA portfolios. So pictured on the left is what LSEs have to do today, actually commission jurisdictional LSEs have to do today. They have to shape their portfolios to the system load through the RA construct. And it's endlessly frustrating. I've heard so much frustration about the MCC buckets and how arbitrary they are, et cetera, et cetera. We're not really moving to that different of a construct. We're moving to something that gives LSEs a little bit more that they can use for their own internal effective management, both one year and multi-year out into the future to try to address their actual resource needs as they go forward. Um, all right, I'm going to leave it there and uh, hope we'll have a lively discussion session after this and uh, welcome any questions. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Nick. And just as a reminder, if you want to uh, be queued up for questions, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll just call you in the order. Um, I saw, I think, Paul, your hand was up from earlier, so maybe I'll, I'll turn to Matt. Hey, hey, Nick, this is Matt Barmack from Calpine. Um, I, I just had one comment and then a question or a set of questions. So the, the, the comment is, you know, I think I think we all agree that the MCC buckets are somewhat inelegant, um, but I feel like it's become a meme in these workshops that 
uh, slice of day completely obviates the need for something like the MCC buckets. And I'm not completely sure that it that it does. I think it captures limitations within an operating day relatively well, but you know, it may not capture, say, um, how DR with a limited number of calls uh, should count. You know, if you have three or four tough days in a row and the DR, you know, might be there on the single worst day, but it won't be there on the fourth worst day. So I, I think that issue surfaced maybe in one of the first few workshops, um, but I view it as sort of an outstanding issue with slice of day. So that's the comment. And the, the, the question is, um, I really like your idea of leveraging the IRP LLE analyses to sort of back into a PRM uh, for, for slice of day. And I, I, think, I think that may be relatively easy to do for like the, um, the peak or net peak hours in the, you know, late summer, early fall months that really drive uh, IRP capacity requirements. Um, but, you know, I think Kathleen and Peter also sort of touched on this issue. You know, how, how, how would you also, or how would, are you just planning to derive a single planning reserve margin or, or how would you think about backing into a planning reserve margin for some of the other hours? I, I think the IRP LLE studies show some loss of load, like in ramping hours, and then you know in the in the monthly construct um, that we have, and 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 that I think you and Edison have proposed to extend. Um, you know, are you are you are you confident that a PRM, you know, sort of derived from calibration to an annual LLE study would would um, ensure reliability in some of the the, the non-peak months? Hey Matt, two, both good points. So first on the demand response can dispatch limitations. I, I totally agree. I think that's the one element of MCC that's not really captured here. Uh, and that, that could extend to other you know, resources that have you know, dispatch limitations. Uh, so I think that's the one element that's lost. And I think you know, to elaborate on this, I think the meme of MCC is that uh, there's a lot of folks who are just begging to have the handcuffs of MCC broken. And I think that's part of the the appeal here uh, and anxiety that a framework that doesn't address that shaping will sustain the continuation of these MCC buckets. Um, on the second point, I think there's a couple elements. So I, I think I'm thinking of the PRM being applied across all hours. Let's stick within one given month here. Um, within one given month, uh, as a means to drive a compliance showing that gets you to that portfolio that's been assessed through LOLE. So you could probably drive that same portfolio showing by just applying the PRM to peak hours. I think it's it's an option. You could probably do this this either way. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ed. I saw your comment there. Um, I think that that you know, given that really, and, and this is true for all the pro proposals, we're using a dumb spreadsheet to try to force a showing that gets to something tested elsewhere. Where it gets a little more complicated is month to month. Do you need to kind of do that calibration for each month? I mean, that's probably to some degree necessary if you think there's constraints in every month. Um, I guess my, my view is most of these resources are, are steel in the ground that's there every month and uh, this is kind of more of a contracting question, but uh, I don't know that. Well, I'll, I'll maybe hold off on that comment, but I, I think like there may be some benefits in thinking about just your peak month and then just applying that PRM across all months, uh, recognizing that really it's just about how do we amortize the annual cost of those resources across different showing periods. Yeah. Now, did, that, did that get to your question? It, it it does, but I, I worry about this issue for, you know, for the reasons that I think Kathleen um, summarized, you know, because there, there actually are some existing analyses of what kind of monthly PRMs are, are necessary to, to 
you know, meet a reliability standard and, you know, you, you get into all kinds of philosophy philosophical debates about you know how you allocate LLE to different different months and whether it makes sense to be you know to meet an LLE standard in a month when you wouldn't actually observe any LLE but um, it, you know I think there are analyses that suggest that sort of a, a, a PRM that's derived from sort of an annual framework um, may, may not apply uh, equally you know may not it, ensure the same level of reliability if, if it's applied monthly. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, ha happy to hear more about that or kind of keep keep thinking through that problem. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> um, Carrie. Hi, Nick. Thanks. I thought this was a really good presentation. Um, and we, as you know, support definitely the IRP RA connection. Um, and I had a similar question to Matt. Um, and, you know, how do you use an, an annual number to determine, you know, hour six in the spring? But I, I think you answered that. And then my follow up was going to be um, if you are going to somehow go into that level of detail, how do you connect the PRM with your resource qualifying capacity values? Because they'll be different. Um, in different hours. Um, so maybe, I think you already addressed the first one, but maybe you could address the second question. Yeah, and Carrie, I guess, let me see if I can clar get a clarifying question here. So are you saying, how do we think about how we apply, like how we determine the counting rules across hours for different resources or how we kind of uh, Yeah, how if PRM you're trying to. That counting? Yeah, so if you're trying to ensure a 1 in 10 LOLE across the hours and you're doing a consistent PRM, then it seems like your counting rules would have to change. And how are you making sure that your counting rules plus whatever your PRM in that hour is still getting you to that 1 in 10 LOLE? Got it. Yeah, okay, good question. So in my view, I don't think I mentioned this very explicitly, but in my view, the resource counting exercise should be something that that happens prior to the PRM calibration of that resource counting. And what we've put forth in our comments, and I think in past workshops, is this notion that really your effort is to figure out what is the actual likely contribution of those resources on an hourly basis. So exceedance for VERs, uh, UCAP, or some similar component for commissional resources, and then some ability to sort of count and distribute DR and storage sort of appropriately consistent with our operating characteristics. So I think that's a that's a kind of the initial exercise and the PRM is essentially there to say, well, the portfolio you get based on those counting rules was off by five or 10 percent relative to what the LOLE study said you needed. So the PRM really is intended to basically correct all of that friction that's actually, you know, in the system and being recognized by the LLE study. So, so to be more explicit here, the PRM is taking all of those counting rules, let's say putting it into this compliance spreadsheet, plugging in all the resources you expect to show up, figuring out what complies, you know, without that PRM, and then adjusting with that PRM to get you to that portfolio you got from the LLE study. I see. I'm not so sure are you that was helpful or more confusing. No, it is. I I just I'm um you know I really I was following you on the connection between IRP and RA, um, but I guess you lose me on the counting because I'm not sure how you're incorporating the counting rules, and it seems like if you're doing the study based on the IRP assumptions, not the RA assumptions, you're not going to get the same PRM. So I guess yes. that's just where you're losing me. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to clarify here, I mean, PRM is is just a number, right? PRM is totally subject to how you count your resources, right? So what the LOLE study says is not necessarily a PRM. It tells you what's the portfolio of resources that gets you to your desired LOLE. You can take a PRM from that relative to a demand forecast, but really it's telling you the portfolio you want. And that's what I'm trying to say is you, you're not necessarily saying you take the PRM from the LLE study and apply it to the counting rules. You take the portfolio from the LLE study and calibrate the counting rules to get that portfolio or count, calibrate the PRM with those counting rules to get that portfolio. Does, does that make sense? It does. So you're not proposing to use the IRP counting rules. You're saying we're going to do that same study with these counting rules. Yeah, I mean, the IRP yeah. doesn't have counting rules. It's yeah, just they just have resources. Yeah. Exercise, right? So yep. yeah, that's that's the equivalence that I think gotcha. needs to be bridged in any construct here. Yep. Okay, I think that makes sense to me. 
Um, and I mean, I still, I hear you on hour six in the spring. That uh, is a, I will take that as a to be resolved issue maybe. Um, and then I had a question on leaning. And, you know, I didn't participate as much um, in this before, so it'd be really helpful to get your perspective. I always take no leaning and in the CPE direction by the CPUC, no leaning to be what has been traditional leaning, which is some LSEs are short and other are long, right? We've seen that for years and the CPUC certainly in many forums has been against that sort of leaning. SCE has provided more RA. The CCAs in some cases have provided less. There are different planning reserve margins among different local reliability areas in California. To me, I get that, but um, it sounds like your definition of leaning seems to be almost not to take advantage of natural load and resource diversity to the extent that you want resources procured to exactly match individual LSEs load shapes. And that's not what I've gotten from the CPUC direction. So I'm wondering if you could help me and maybe it is their direction. I just, I don't know. Yeah, it's a great question, Carrie. And I, I'm not the expert on this history. I can provide, you know, at least my perspective on the last couple of years. Uh, I think historically leaning is as you describe. It's a quantity question, particularly around local RA and whether you know some LSEs might be deficient or et cetera, et cetera. I think in recent years, with the emergence of preferred resources and some, you know, well, <laughs> I'll just say the emergence of preferred resources, uh, it's become more of a mixed question at the system level. Um, so in the last couple of years, the most recent MCC bucket change. I don't know if I can explain this without explaining the MCC, which will blow all of our time here. But it's all right. I, I know what they, MCC buckets they, are. I do lots but, of consulting for yeah. many CCAs. No, I'm no, very familiar mean, with the MCC. Okay, I don't, I don't yeah. mean I don't mean for you, but for the the whole group here, I'm going to try to avoid explaining any detail. But the 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 commission established a new MCC requirement, essentially to move solar and wind out of the kind of dispatchable 24 seven category and sort of create this new essentially just 24 seven dispatchable resource category. That was at least as I understand it intended to address some LSEs over being overly reliant on solar and wind or command response or storage or whatever, but you could think of the same thing if an LSE was uh, reliant on a gas resource that only had six dispatches a month or whatever, right? There's like lots of different constraints. And so the, the MCC buckets have been intended to push all LSEs to show a set of resources that is roughly consistent with the system mix. And this is not my policy in, initiative or my goal, but this is kind of tracking what the commission has been trying to know. do I, from a leading yeah, perspective no, I'm not saying it's yours. I'm just, yeah, trying to get at what you mean by no. So I think that's really helpful. Um, and it's an interesting perspective that I will be frank, I don't think we fully considered within the two slice proposal, because in my mind, as an economist, I look at the market and that's something the market does naturally by prices, right? You, by the time you get to the RA, um, RA time frame, there's a fixed number of resources that are available um, and you have to meet your requirement. And thermal resources right now are some of the cheapest, so they go first. So naturally the dispatchable resources get procured first. And as a system, we are made sufficient. Um, the idea that you know the MCC buckets came into place made sense to me as a, a system requirement, um, not as much as an LSE requirement. So, you know, I, I think maybe two things. One, we should be really clear by what we mean on leaning and what we're going to allow. Does each LSC have to meet their load shape? Is that actually a goal um, that is set by the CPUC? Or is it roughly they need to about meet their requirement, right? Because that leads to a very different policy decision. And it's much more costly, I'll add, for an LSC to have to meet their own individual load shapes. Um, and then two, I think maybe taking a step back and saying, okay, how do we bucket this in a way where we're ensuring reliability at least cost and still maintaining those non-leaning principles because I'm not sure we're there yet. But thank you, Nick. That was a very helpful discussion for me. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. <clears throat> Maybe Paul. Hi, this is Paul Nelson on behalf of Clica. Um, I had a discussion with Peter in his presentation talking about how UCAP, the use of UCAP and perhaps the use of a one in five low target would affect the PRM. And in the calibration, it wasn't clear to me whether those issues are automatically resolved 
in your calibration approach, or is that something that would need to be perhaps in the next iteration of your of your work here? Yeah, it's a great question, Paul. I think uh, so. To two answers. One is, you know, in this hypothetical calibration where everything is solved and we know exactly what we're doing, uh, we're counting firm resources however we think they should be counted. I think if we're gonna, we probably will be moving towards UCAP or we'll probably be moving towards some th sort of D-rate structure based on expected performance. So we'll, this would probably have UCAP or something like it incorporated. Uh, so I think that's the the big picture answer is is yes. The sort of more precise answer is of how this would work. I think there's a lot of party policy development in terms of exactly what counting rules should be used, whether it's for thermal, hydro, et cetera, et cetera. And then what, about, think, what about the load forecast? Did yeah, I, I think it's, again, it's an open point of, of debate. Um, you know, if you assume you use one and two, it's going to result in one PRM. I think one thing that to me is, is somewhat appealing of a one in five or one in 10 uh, would be perhaps some shaping effects that might occur during those extreme heat events that may be relevant. I don't I'm kind of hy hypothesizing here, um, but whatever you choose, the PRM should effectively be recalibrated to get you to the same portfolio. It's really just about how does it actually interact with the structure here? Right. Like I said, and this is where I said it wasn't clear to me whether it was automatically embedded in your calibration because I'm looking at the step three and you're calibrating to an IRP megawatt portfolio and not explicitly to a load forecast. Right. Yeah. And Paul, I think the intent there is that the IRP is is in Servam. There's the stochastic exercise and it's looking at this whole range of potential load events, including the kind of long tail of extreme weather. Um, and so all you really know from that is, okay, for all these hypothetical futures we have, we know the distribution of weather and resource performance, and, and this is the portfolio of resources, just nameplate capacity that we think can carry us through that with a specific reliability standard. And that's, to me, that's really the critical takeaway from the um, LOLE study, not any PRM number or anything like that. It's kind of right, just you right. got your your portfolio and you need to replicate that portfolio on the RA side. Okay. No, well, this is a good presentation to kind of way to think about things. Uh, I appreciate it. A lot of good work that Judge Steve's done in this. All right. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. And I think we could close out uh, this presentation with, with Brent. If you want to go ahead. Hi, uh, Brent Buffington from Southern California Edison. Uh, so, so Nick, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know, as he presented earlier, we didn't mention um, the, the construction of the PRM, but I just want to throw my weight behind, or you know, throw, throw support behind this, and uh, make you know, I think it should be clear to everyone now that as we change our uh, resource counting, as we you know, reconfirm our um, kind of dedication to one in ten. That the uh, that the LOLE process to develop a new PRM is it has to be done, um, and SE has suggested that be done in IRP space, and and we've you know suggested like the, the actual process to to go about it, um, and and that you know also expecting that that underlies more of the IRP decisions than it has recently. But just want to point out that, uh, yes, this is a kind of core piece of what SE thinks needs to happen in any slice of day um, you know, framework that, that we end up with is is re, is do a uh, PRM, not 15 percent because that's what, what it was set in uh, mid 2000s, um, but uh, a, a PRM that's set based on an LOLE. And it might it might be different in different months. Great, thanks, Brent. Appreciate that. And I think as as I was hearing your and Jeff's presentation earlier of of the steps for determining load and adjusting, I think this really fits in well as a sort of sequential step to that and thinking about how this like this final step of kind of how it interacts with what we actually expect LSEs to show is is really critical here, whether it's top down, bottom up, or or something else. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. And I see a. And come in from Kathleen. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I just uh, thanks for giving me a second. Um, I appreciate the presentation, Nick. Uh, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. I 
you know, I'm, I am noticing some synergies across the day, which I think is actually a nice, <laughs> I don't know if I felt that way to workshop before. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, I would, if you don't mind, kind of touch base and I want to highlight this, the, what I see is consistent and kind of aligned um, from what we put forward. Um, and I, I felt that way too, a little bit with, um, uh, with Peter uh, is confirming that and Brent echoed it. So I do think that there's a synergy on this idea of arriving to our requirement out of a probabilistic, I hope probabilistic loss of load expectation. I um, want to note that and say that that's comforting for me to hear that across multiple presenters today. Um, the other thing and, and the, what you just both just talked about is very consistent with Vista and Gridwell's proposal as well. Determ perform the LOLE, determine the portfolio that's needed. And then if you want to calculate a PRM, and I like the way you say it, I think of the same way. If you want to, you can, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can calculate a PRM. I do think it would be different by months. I think that there are some months where PRM, if there's no loss of load, could be a hundred, you know, it could be zero, it could be a hundred percent instead of 115 percent of what you need, or 130 um, percent. I kind of see that in my mind as a potential outcome of what we're all talking about if we were to do this on a monthly basis. Um, the other thing, and I did want to point out for you, and I'd like your feedback, how we had been thinking of integrating the IRP. Um, was in, we were thinking you would still need to do another LOLE for the RA need um, because you were isolating it only to really online quote unquote resources and not planned. But I suggested and floated that um, idea of maybe a bit of an expansion to that where we would include even in the RA portfolios um, projects that have executed contracts to meet IRP. So if you kind of think about it from that perspective, I think that's kind of similar to what you're saying. It's just a different way of looking at it, but it would bound it only to projects that we have confidence will achieve COD during that year that we're looking at RA need. Um, I wanted to connect the dot and see if you think that is kind of consistent and you see the synergy there or not. Yeah, Kathleen, thanks. I appreciate the comments. I, I think so. And I think this is one augmentation in IRP space is there hasn't been a tremendous amount of near term analysis. There was more in this last cycle, or I guess this is in the summer reliability proceeding, but there's um, I think there is this need to spend more time on the next one, two and three years to get the data we would need to do this RA calibration. And I, I think just to your point, we're going to know a lot about the NQC list, the existing resources. We're going to have fairly good confidence that we know what LSEs are imminently bringing online. And what we might need to think through a little bit is, you know, what's the delay risk or whatever, you know, connection risk that we might have if some of those resources we anticipate are delayed a month or six months or get canceled. But hopefully that's kind of marginal enough that we can we can tackle it. The other element is that you know we should be thinking about okay let's do this three four years out in the IRP uh, and then the next year we're doing this again because IRP is always happening um, and we're we're updating it we're refining it right and this kind of keeps coming back to this idea of instead of open heart surgery it's preventative maintenance let's get as much good robust information that we can for a few years out in the future and continually refine it improve it based on what actually happens on the system and, and better information. Yeah, I appreciate that, Nick. I, I think our proposals could get kind of aligned a little um, with the caveat that I still feel the RA loss of load expectation study is really necessary so that we're confident that our RA fleet um, can meet that one in 10. So I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable just taking the forward years of IRP and back and then trying to translate it, um, but thinking of it more as performing we're performing short-term LOLEs which should be the same general I mean generally speaking same thing with different generation portfolio right um, and maybe some uncertainty refinements that are crisper for short-term modeling that we may not be as certain about for the long-term modeling so I do think that there's kind of like a long-term short-term changes perhaps but if we think about them in its entirety I think of them the same way I hear you saying it. We got prompt year, prompt next that we need to have targets for uh, what the portfolio needs to be. And then the IRP is really hitting that three, 
well, I, this last iteration was three to, you know, five years out, um, 23, 26, the next six years kind of thing. But um, I appreciate what you brought forward. And I would just kind of note that um, the one concern I have with your proposal to just take IRP is that I do think there may be changes that are needed for an RA specific LOLE. Yeah, def definitely, Kylie, and I, I agree. I think there's there's more modeling that probably needs to be done relative to what's what's currently happening. Just more more years and kind of more portfolios. Um, the one thing I, I did want to flag here, and I, I realized I never brought this into the presentation, was you know we might do a study in the IRP that shows in 2026 after we you know have some retirements there's a different set of resources that's needed. And we may need to think about, even if it's not necessary for 2024, are there resources that may need to be retained or prevented from retirement or whatever? You know, there might need to be some backing out from future years. I know this has been a theme in some of the IRP discussions, but something we might need to think through is what, how do we plan for what we need 10 years out, not just, you know, two years out. So that, that can be part of this IRP process, I think to flag potential concerns like that. Uh, Noah? Hey, this is uh, Noah from Middle River. Uh, just going on that conversation you're having with Kathleen, I'm wondering whether or not, uh, and, and Nick, it may not be sort of you that know the answer to this, by the way. Um, so anybody who's willing to uh, help out and jump in is be great. Um, you know, sort of under IRP, we get this uh, idea of an LOLE that uh, either, you know, higher than or lower than 0.1. LOLE, um, then that can translate into a sort of a plan reserve margin for us. But then in RA space, we, yes, we have potentially a different, uh, well, you have a different set of accounting rules um, that would yield a different PRM, but you also may have, you know, the monthly granularity to the extent that you have um, uh, more supply than your need, right? In that case, how do you determine that planning reserve margin um, is sort of very specific to the set of resources you're going to expect? How do you ensure there's a sort of a standard capacity product, one megawatt value as good as just as another for this part of PRM? I, and I see Brent has his uh, uh, hand raised as well, so. Yeah, you know, no, maybe I can take a stab at it. I think, yeah. correct me if I'm, if I'm misunderstanding the question, but I think the idea is, how do you get the PRM that gets you the, the showing that you actually want, right? Um, and I think that the, the central piece, as you said, is how do you how do you have a standard megawatt? And I think the idea is we're living in a world where there is no such thing as a standard megawatt, right? Um, but the way we can try to get at that, and, and this is one of the themes I wanna, wanna highlight is, we have a lot of information about what we anticipate LSEs are gonna show. You know, the vast majority of solar and storage is being built under contract to an LSE 10, 15, 20 years with an RA component, we know it's gonna get shown, right? So we don't really have to have that much guesswork about the quantity of solar and storage it's gonna get shown in a filing that's six or eight months out. What we really have less certainty around is what are all these kind of residual, the marginal resources. I don't, I don't wanna use the term marginal pejoratively, it's not the intent, but the, the resources that are gonna fill that net position. And I think that set of resources is probably going to be consisting of a much larger share of these firm resources where a megawatt kind of is a megawatt, whether it's a megawatt of uh, fossil or hydro or imports, you know, there may be some limitations, but they're going to be much, much more homogenous than I think the more complicated set of resources to do accounting on. Does that, no, does that answer your question? I, yeah, I'm, I'm still maybe missing the steps of how do we, how do we get that sort of perfect planning reserve margin number for an April month um, be, uh, when we have a lot of excess supply and we, we're, un, we're sort of unsure, you know, what the uh, what will be sh shown and or rather what is shown to meet the requirement it is sufficient to, to meet 0.1 LOLE. Right. Yeah, and this I think gets to, to Matt's question. So we could do a PRM study month by month and try to create this month by month. I think at the end of the day, if we're trying to target a September constraint and LSEs still have to show internal consistency on capacity and energy, um, I think there's a pretty good chance that what gets shown for April is sufficient for April if we've got presumably 
wave long on firm resources in April. But that's, I mean, that is that's something we need to think through is how does this work across the months um, and whether there's some adjustments that need to be made on a month by month basis. Uh, looks like I think Brent may be up next. Yeah, so Brent Buffington from SC again, and I guess this is partially in response to, to Noah's question. So in an IRP space uh, and associated LOLE, so I should also say IRP is still in process, right? So um, there's, we haven't gone through a fully successful cycle yet in re integrated resource planning um, st statewide. So we are finishing out cycle two, all the procurement decisions, none of the procurement decisions so far have been based on a robust loss of load expectation. All that said, um, resource counting in IRP space is our like hourly expected capacity, our hourly expected you know capacity to produce energy. So that that's what resource counting is in IRP space. Um, you know, SE's proposal in particular, so that this this monthly hourly preserves that. It actually it links those, and that's that's the link that that gets you from a modeled, you know, a modeled um excess generation capacity to achieve a 0.1 lole and allows you to transfer that into um irp uh, into resource adequacy space uh you know it it remains to be seen because that hasn't been done yet um but that that that's the expectation is that uh, by aligning the resource counting between what's you know, actually or will be done in IRP space, which is like, you know, hourly resource modeling um, with, uh, you know, the same counting in RA space that you'll be able to, to translate cleanly between uh, PRMs in IRP and the required RA PRM in RA space. Yeah. Hey, Brent. So what I think what um, I, I understand the intent, but what I get lost is in IRP space, we have a 11 and a half gig requirement to be built uh, to build resources, um, you know, to meet uh, with incremental ELCC values. And then when you transfer that those ELCC values into um, different, like it, under Edison's proposal, my understanding is sort of profiles. Um, it, it, there seems to be a different counting methodology then, right? To which case, then how do I know what the PRM is to get back to point one? Yeah, and and I just want to caution that the, the procurement order is not actually directly related to any LOLE analysis. Um, so it's it's kind of its own thing, and that's is not directly even related to, to the resource counting that should be or will be in an IRP space. I, I but I, I do agree. So that that procurement order is with incremental EOCC, a brand new measure, um, and it's going to result in something like thirty thousand megawatts of nameplate, twenty five to thirty thousand megawatts of nameplate. It's a pretty large portion of our of our grid, but in the end. We're just going to have resources. We're just going to have solar. We're, there's going to be solar, solar, wind, hybrids, storage, and each of those elements are going to have an expected contribution on an hourly basis. So, you know, you know, at least our, our strong proposal is that you know when they come online, they'll be counted based on their actual expected contribution on an hourly basis. Regardless of, of what how they were used to meet midterm reliability procurement orders, right? But uh, I think what the missing piece then is, what is the difference in the PRM um, within IRP and the PRM that would be calculated here in RA? Um, I, I I don't think you know. Obviously, we haven't seen any of that information. I don't I don't know when we would, um, but I, I fully agree that we we. Uh, we do need to run some type of, some of that calculation soon. I, I I agree with that for sure. I'll put my hand up. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I think Doug, you're up next. Oh, Doug, we lost yeah. your hand. No, I was putting it down. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things that you know, thinking about the monthly loss of 
load analysis and so forth. I mean, I think one of the, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how you would um, allocate that, allocate a 0.1 LO, um, loss of load expectation among months, right? Because that's a, that's, that's like a 10% of an event anywhere in the year. And so, and, you know, as we go forward, different months are going to have different likelihoods. And so I don't know, like, do we say like a 5% chance in July and a 5% chance in August and zero everywhere else um, and so forth? It's start that, like, you could do that a priori, but it does seem, you know, you'd have to have a whole analytical method for doing that to justify why you're you know, allowing particular probabilities of outages in each month so that the whole year comes up to a 10% chance of an outage in any given year. Um, and it gets really complicated too, is the load mix changes, um, or not sorry, the generation mix and storage changes because like if we retire a whole bunch of gas and move very heavily into renewables, a lot of solar and storage in particular, then, you know, July, August, September are going to be really easy to address. And December, January, March, February, those are going to be the really hard months. And I do think that the month in which grid stress shows up is very much a function of what the resources being used are. And so I'm not sure we can say a priori that we can like think intelligently about a, a monthly PRM in, our, in that way, because we can't really define a monthly loss of load expectation that is, you know, adds up to an annual probability of an outage that's politically acceptable. It's not to say it can't be done. I just haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Doug, I, I hear you on that. I think a couple kind of stepping back on this month to month question. I mean, I think this kind of speaks to as well as other reasons why a lot of folks think like a seasonal or even a one year showing for resources might make sense because at the end of the day, it's about maintaining a fleet that can serve your load year round, right? Um, I'm not I'm not endorsing that specifically, but you could see the appeal of not having to think about, well, how much residual firm do we need to have in May versus September? Well, if it's going to be there in September, it's probably going to be there in May, right? Hopefully, uh, whether it's shown as RA is, is a different question, but it's going to exist, right? And so I think stepping back from this, you know, we have part of the benefit, I think, of doing this slice framework is it's an approximation, right? And it's going to give us a good sense of are we approaching an energy sufficiency challenge or capacity challenge in April or October or January, right? It's going to start, it's the, the alarms are going to be start starting to blare, right? Both with the commission and for LSEs years in advance if we're doing this on a forward looking basis. So that's kind of one element is it's, it's a tool in addition to actual LOLE analysis, which hopefully on a multi-year basis is also going to be identifying periods where you have loss of load, right? For the, for the portfolio that doesn't hit 0.1. Uh, which could start popping up in the winter time. I completely agree. Uh, but then stepping back just from kind of an economist standpoint, you're know, really the expensive procurement. And when when we all toss out these big numbers, I'm guilty of this myself. That's about building something new most of the time, right? It's building new capacity is what's really driving a ton of cost. All of the rest of this, whether it's month to month, it's about maintaining the existing resource fleet. And yes, that costs money and it's it can be very real money, but it's it's we don't have to be, I think, as precise and cautious about, you know, whether we get the April requirement a little bit too high to make sure April is good, but really it's September that's driving the steel on the ground decision. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to be too flippant with that comment, but I think really we need to be thinking about what are the massive investment decisions, and then how do we make sure that whole fleet is available when it's needed throughout the year. So I don't want to I don't want to be too wait, hand wavy about the complexity here, but I think there that's really what we need to be focusing on is the you know near term and long term steel on the ground investment decisions. Uh, Kathleen, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, no, I just wanted to. It's it's a good. Uh, so if you don't mind, if I could share, um, this is something I'm thinking a lot about, um, and part of the reason I wanted to highlight for the group to check out the WEC assessment. Um, on RA sufficient resource adequacy in California. Super good. There's a link to that in my presentation. Um, and the CPUC's uh, presentation itself that went from the annual 8, 8760, broke the LOLE down into months 
and then highlighted within the months where there was a risk of loss of load, uh, what the generation capacity is needed. I think one way to think about it, and, and I'm a keep it simple, stupid kind of person. That's how I do my market design. So I try to boil things down to things that make into intuitive sense in addition to our support with analytics. Really like the analytics that I've suggested. There's probably others. Feel free to share them with me if anyone has um, would like to. Uh, I think that a way to think about across the year is that months with no loss of load, it, with no risk of a loss of load, um, when you run the loss of load expectation and you kind of break it down into those months, what even the CPUC's energy division chart, um, if you look at, I think I snipped this one in our presentation and it shows 0%, so zero LOLE for months one through six and 10 through 12. Um, we need to look into the results of that to see if what that means is less capacity is needed to meet one in 10 than we have in our fleet, or if it's trued up to exactly. Because I can't from that look and say, is our PRM 100% of our, our online resources? Or not PRM, is our requirement 100%? And I think the better way to think of it is the requirement that the LOLE tells us we need to have 100% in those months, or is it less? And is it really only, we only need 80% some months in order to ride through those months. And that level, that kind of way of thinking of it about it might be helpful. Um, the months that have more tightness, uh, so I think that was uh, July, August, and September, um, would have an incremental need. And so LSEs could think about this as they need to buy kind of their annual needs across to meet what is needed and perhaps that's all resources that are online need to have an RA contract, need to be you know, subscribed to these requirements for all months. But in the months that have a, a loss of load expectation that is not meeting one in 10, we need to ensure that there are in additional requirements for those months. And so that's an additional profile that, that uh, additional contracts need to be signed with those months in mind. Could be annual, it could be seasonal, they could be monthly um, under kind of a monthly framework, but it may boil down to how we go about contracting once we understand the monthly requirements, the same as we do today. Um, but I do think the LOLE study should inform those and we should be thinking about those other months as largely probably either something less than or equal to our online resources. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. Jen, I think that wraps up the queue. I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, so this kind of, we're at the end of the today's workshop. I know it was really long, but appreciate all the all the presentations. Um, and just to kind of sum up where we're at today, you know, we've had two workshops on the structural elements, two on resource counting, uh, two on needs determination and allocation. And our next workshop is really on recapping all that work. And I think we're starting to do some of the identification of what some of those common elements are. And, and I'm sure people are having conversations and working offline to, to uh, uh, identify, you know, where there is consensus and where there isn't. Um, and so that's that's one of the very purposes of our next workshop on the 15th. Uh, it's going to be a recap of all, all of these presentations. And for those who want to um, uh, present uh, at that uh, December 15th workshop, uh, please remember to contact the co-facilitators by this Friday, December 3rd. And um, be sure to send presentation materials as well by Friday, uh, December 10th. That's a week um, after. Um, and so that uh, the co-facilitators can can be prepared um, uh, to to send out the presentations in advance, um, and also uh, so that parties have an opportunity to, to review some of the proposals. Um, other key deadlines to be aware of: uh, the next set of informal comments are due Wednesday, December twenty second, and so um, upon reviewing that, the the recap materials and presentations, you know, everyone will have an opportunity to provide more detailed written comments. Uh, you know, focusing in particular on the need determination and allocation and the recap of the workshops. Um, another thing that the co-facilitators have, have planned 
is releasing two surveys. Um, and so this might be a good way to get for us to get some data points on how uh, different stakeholders rank the, the various elements of the various uh, versions of the slice of day proposals that have been presented to date so that we can rank those proposals and, and kind of get a general sense of the direction of you know where there is majority or consensus support on various items and where there might be um, more disagreement or areas to work on. And then the last thing I believe um, at the last workshop um, there uh, was discussion about holding a, an additional workshop on storage for Friday, December 17th, and I just saw on the service list, um, SCE uh, issued that um, calendar hold or, or email notice on that workshop. Um, and so uh, definitely look out for that email to, to participate there as well. Um, yeah, Sue, I see your hand raised. I know we have six minutes left, so um, if there's any questions about logistics, next steps, or, or um, any last comments, happy to hear them. So Sue, go ahead. Yeah, I have a quick question on compiling the survey results. So uh, I guess one of our concerns would be that you say, oh, there's uh, 50 in this category and three over there when the 50 are all one type of LSC, for example, CCAs. So I would, I'm happy to hear the compilations, but I'd also like to know it by uh, LSC type. So you could have the IOUs are in, here's where they stand, the ESPs are here, the CCAs are there. Also, you can provide, uh, you know, the complete compilation, but would be, um, I think, useful also to hear if there's a significant different by LS, difference by LSE type. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's very good feedback. Uh, I'll, I'll take that back to the other facilitators as well. Thanks, Sue. Uh, Bridget, you have your hand up? Yes, I just wanted to respond to Sue's comment. So we um, definitely thought of that when we were designing the survey. And so our intention is that organizations would submit one response to the survey. So we don't need all of your um, folks to submit separate um, survey results. Um, ideally, we would like it, you know, one organ one survey response per organization, um, and we will be. Um, you know, collecting the names of folks so you would be able to identify it. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we went with the after the fact survey rather than some of the real time polling that was suggested was to better account for um, the fact that, you know, larger organizations could skew results just because they had more people voting. Um, so we do, you know, share your concern, um, Sue, and we're trying to, you know, mitigate that. Thank you. In fact, could I ask a follow-up question, please? Sure. Okay. Uh, my follow-up question is, so uh, when you say an organization, so there's ARM, which is an ESP organization, but it doesn't include all the ESPs. There's CalCCA that may include all the CCAs, I don't know. And then there's other various organizations uh, for, for generators, uh, WPTF includes various, uh, you know, even LSCs in it. So uh, I'm not too sure when you say organization, how, I mean, what, what were you thinking when you were, when you were um, deciding on that? What, so give me, I guess, give me more information on who would be responding to your uh, survey. Um, I think we were kind of leaving it up to parties to recognize themselves as an organization. So I would imagine CalCCA could submit one, but I don't think that precludes like Peninsula Clean Energy from submitting a separate one. Um, but we wouldn't want like 10 people from SCE to submit one, um, but rather them to be discrete organizations. So even though they might be have overlapping interests, they're still sort of separate parties. So, you know, think about it, like would you submit comments on behalf of yourself, then, um, then that's kind of who should be um, responding to the survey, if that makes sense. So it's, does that help? Um, a little bit. I could just see all, you know, you might get like 35 CCAs and Cal CCA submitting, and I don't know what you do with that. And then you might have ARM and 
a couple other ESPs submitting. So it's just, it's going to be difficult to know what to do with it. It's just my, I guess, my feeling on that. Um, I will also say that these results are going to be informal, so they won't be in the final report to the commission. It's really just helping parties to get a temperature read of what aspects we've been discussing. There seems to be kind of consensus coalescing around. So we're really viewing it as a way for the group to kind of get some more data on, you know, where are we starting to build consensus or where does it seem like there's more support? Um, you know, who's supporting that? Is that kind of balancing interests? Um, so th this survey should really be treated as like a data point for us to consider, but um, just so folks are aware, it's not, your responses to the survey doesn't lock you into a position. Um, and so it's really just a way for us to kind of see like, is there, more support coalescing around, um, you know, the 24 hour time slices, or is there more support coalescing around the six, four hour time slices? Um, just to kind of give us another data point as a group to kind of figure out, is there seeming to be consensus building around certain elements or, you know, do we need to have like a hybrid, you know, combining elements across um, different proposals? Um, so really just trying to give um, you know, proposal sponsors an idea of like where participants might be more or less supportive of one element over another. Um, so again, it's just trying to get a different data point um, and some numbers um, that we may not necessarily be picking up from just going off of who's commenting or who's putting in stuff in the chat. So. So the mandate we all have from the commission is to submit a report in February that shows the consensus areas and the areas where there is no consensus. So have the facilitators given any additional thought to how we get there from where we are today? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the survey can be directionally helpful and, and that and one of the purposes of the, the recap workshop is to have some of the, these discussions um, to, to work toward that. All right, um, Nick. Hey, thanks, Jen. I, just to follow up on the last discussion, and Bridget, thanks for, for putting this together, the survey. I just want to ask, will, will the positions be public? Because I, I think that could address a lot of Sue's concerns, which I, I share. Um, we have of a group haven't talked about how the results are going to be compiled and, and messaged to the group, but we have a meeting right after this to discuss that. So uh, the intent is to make it the results transparent. So um, there will be some sort of summarization of um, the results. So um, yes, they will be made public some way, shape, or form. And I, I do agree that being able to identify who's holding what position would be also be important. So. Um, I think we would also look to make that public in the whatever final results, however they're shared. Got it. Thanks, Bridget. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. A question about um, uh, I know people I saw in the chat that uh, people who had not circulated their presentations from today were going to do so, but uh, I haven't seen anything in my email after uh, the Edison presentation that was circulated this morning. This is Lisa. Tom, this is, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, no, I was just gonna um, say, I, I errantly only serve mine to one batch. So let me see if I can connect with folks to get it circulated after this. Thank you. Sorry, Lisa, were you gonna clarify? Yeah, I was going to mention that um, the decks we we did receive um, by um, late Monday, we did circulate. 
Um, and so individuals or organizations that haven't served it or didn't make it available to the co-facilitators can serve it themselves. Um, I am making them available to the energy division for them to post on their website. Thanks, Lisa. Doug? Trying to reach the unmute button here. Yeah, just um, logistical bit from Cal CCA. So I'm the only CCA rep here today because today coincides with the annual Cal CCA summit. So that's where everybody else is. So I'm nominally both Cal CCA and PCE, but we do generally strive to get consensus. And so I expect um, at least on the CCA world, there's probably going to be just a Cal CCA response there, unless there's like some big among the CCAs where some some people really think one thing and some people really think another. But by and large, we've largely been aligned. So I suspect at least for us that can we will endeavor to alleviate concerns around having all 24 of us chime in. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Mary? Yeah, hi, this is Mary Lynch with Constellation, and I wanted to echo some of Sue's concerns. Um, I guess I'm not quite following if the survey isn't going to be part of the report and isn't otherwise going to be part of the record, and we're going to have a session at the end where there are recaps of all the proposals and discussions where I'm presuming it'll become pretty clear what people's positions are. I, I'm just not sure what what is the survey actually going to be used for if we're doing all this other stuff and it's not going to be part of the record um so are, the, are the group go ahead go ahead yeah so the intent of the element survey was to give party or um folks like se pg e gridwell who are the ones that have kind of put out um sort of the more cohesive proposals uh, information for them to help shape because a lot of the proposals had options. Um, so we still haven't like nailed down like what are the exact seasons. So this element survey could be used by the um, like proposal sponsors to say, oh, it looks like more support for four seasons. So in my final proposal that I'm presenting on the 15th, it might behoove me to select that option. Um, so it's the first survey is really to kind of help the um, proposal sponsors know kind of other different options that they presented. Where do there seem to be kind of coalescing support among the options? And so, you know, PG&E would know, OK, everybody's supporting gross load. So in my final proposal, I'll make it on gross load or everybody's supporting the net load. Let me do that option. Um, or for example, for resource counting, we have ELCC exceedance kind of under um, contention. And so if there seems to be more support around exceedance, um, then that might help them determine, you know, what elements to select for that specific. And then the intent of the second survey is um, trying to get just to, you know, a numerical um, and possibly a ranking against the principal. So we haven't designed that survey yet, but the idea is um, in the comments, it's sometimes hard to compare positions, whereas a survey, you can compare parties directly based on the same questions. Um, and so that's kind of the thought behind um, a second survey is trying to get more directly comparable results across parties, whereas in the written comments, you might have to interpret what they said. OK, but but you said that the surveys are not going to be part of the record. So all that's going to be part of the record are the comments. Um, I mean, the facilitators, that's what we had said. If folks disagree with that, we could um, put it in the report. Um, I, I guess, and, and obviously I want to talk with some of my colleagues more internally and externally, but it, it it's feeling like the survey, at least that second one, feels to me to be a little bit unnecessary and, and perhaps could be used to oversimplify people's positions or 
um, make analysis about you know groupings of positions that that maybe are are better off not not um, um, brought down to that level of of uniformity because my guess is based on the discussions to date there's going to be a lot of comments and a lot of different positions and a lot of mixing and matching and it just seems to me that a lot of that's going to get you know can't possibly be represented in a survey um, that you know I, th I think the comments are going to have to stand on their own that's how I'm feeling about it right now but that's you know just just a comment at this point. Mary, if I if I can, this is Scott from IP. Just as I was involved in the discussions on helping to come up with the idea of the survey and provided some feedback on it. <clears throat> um, I mean, it is meant to be beneficial to the uh, the proponents of different proposals. Um, so that is one value. But the other is just to for parties, you know, ourselves to all see how we align in you know in a really easy format on individual elements and maybe to help all of us um, develop some kind of hybrid that gets the support of 90% of the, the parties because we're taking pieces of the different proposals that can fit together in a way that just get more support. And yeah, we have we like, <clears throat> um, I think Bridget was saying, we, we haven't decided if that would be necessarily an appendix to the final report, um, but it but it could be, it could be a useful um, uh, you know, kind of historical record of where parties stood, but but it's also preliminary. We're not asking people to necessarily um, irrevocably adopt whatever positions they might express in the survey. Okay, I I, I appreciate that explanation. It, it just it's just feeling like sort of an oversimplification of something that's clearly become very complex, and you know, surveys and taking positions almost feels, you know, like we're talking settlement of some sort, which I know we're not. And it's just, it just kind of, it just doesn't feel like it fits together to me, but um, I'm just one person. So I appreciate the explanations. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate that. Uh, Kathleen, maybe you could wrap us up with the final question. Sure. I'll just be short and sweet then. Um, I just wanted to confirm. So these surveys will include kind of options that are have been floated. And I, I think I heard a couple different things from Bridget. At first I heard it was just pg and &E and SCE um, because she mentioned 24 and six slices. But then I heard her say Gridwell's two slice as well. And I just wanted to confirm, is that the universe or is it also, I mean, I also know Nick has put some stuff forward. So I'm a, I was a little confused with the examples if it was an all inclusive of everything we've talked about or if specific things had been picked to focus on. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we our intention is to get the choice set from all of the proposals. Um, and we're also including a write in option for other. So um, but yes, Gridwell's was included, elements of what Nick's presented is included. Um, the NLRF proposal that we just heard this morning will be included. Um, so the intent is trying, trying to capture all of the options. Um, and so to the extent that there's overlap where, you know, multiple proposals were advocating for a gross load, then that option was just selected. Um, but yeah, the idea is that trying to capture the, you know, the choice set of everything that was discussed so far was the intent. Got it. Got it. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I know we ran a little bit over, but appreciate everyone sticking around just to discuss some of those logistics. Uh, as a reminder, if you're interested in presenting, uh, send in your request to the co-facilitators this Friday. Um, and otherwise, hope everyone has a great rest of the night and see everyone on the 15th.